You are listening to the 100th episode of the Mountainside Podcast, and we are recording at Half Face Blades here in San Diego, California, with my friend Andrew Arabito. He is a true outdoorsman, craftsman, and friend. This was a great conversation. I always enjoy Beto's company, and there was no better way to bring in the 100th episode. I'm so genuinely grateful for all the listener support over 100 episodes. You guys are amazing, and thank you for listening. Like um, some some of it stuff I bought from other makers, and then I have like a favorite maker who does these uh, these forged tomahawks overseas. I have a couple real tomahawks I've got from auctions. Like really, these uh, like period. Yeah, so there's some eighteen hundreds. I have two real eighteen hundreds tomahawks from these auction houses, and then uh, some other stuff I bought from different makers. A few gifts, and then I have. The majority of these that you're looking at are from this tomahawk maker overseas. I don't want to name his name because then I won't get any more hawks from him. Everybody else will. But I found him. Kind of like your stigma. Yeah, he's got a, you know he's got a small following. He's growing, but his stuff is just so badass. I actually got three more today. This one's sick. I just got this. Thing. Yeah, show them off, man. We got oh, this one today. This one's dope. I haven't even. Wow. This one's sick. Just a spike. That is right. wicked. Damascus spike with a hammer. I'm gonna keep this one in my truck for those times when I yeah. don't need to use it, but I want Under to. Under the use overpasses? It. Like, hey, <laughs> oh, look, I need to go to work, but you're all walking in the middle of the highway. <laughs> you know it's getting I mean? crazy around here, man. Like, I don't understand it. It's you know, worse. I spent 20 years in the South Bay up in LA, and. Oh, yeah. That's an entire. Like, San Diego still feels pretty. Pretty chill. Compared. Pretty chill, yeah, compared to there. Yeah. This one's just a, a little more simple, non-Damascus forge, but just really, wow. really cool. A little longer cool. stick. That one, that, I haven't even looked at these ones. I just kind of unpacked them earlier today, stuck them on the shelf. I, have so, I mean, I probably now have like 15 yeah, of this I guy's know. tomahawks. What is the peace pipe one over there? Is that, there's a bunch of them in the peace pipe. So okay. He makes these too. This one's dope. I you can out, actually smoke I, out of them? Oh, yeah, I smoke out of yeah. this one quite a bit. Yeah. Get some organic tobacco. Yeah. Got the little pin here, so if it gets clogged. Ah, oh, that's a wicked. Pin here in the end. Clean it. You know? Those are dope, man. Yeah, these are cool. He did a Super few, cool. uh, few Damascus. He did he had a buddy. Did a few where his buddy engraved. So this is a real This one's pretty cool. So this is a peace wow. bike too, but it's also a eighteen eighteen nineties, I believe. I have some documentation. What is some one. of this wood that they're using on the that's probably a Handles. maple. I'm not sure what this one is. It's probably a, uh, some kind of curly, curly walnut, maybe curly maple. He did a really it's good cool, job. Man. It's cool, man. It's got like the weight to it. This one's a real one, 1800s. What's cool is like there's old engraving in it, success to liberty. Really? And it has like a native with a heart on his chest. And then it has like the American shield and the eagle holding arrows in one hand and maybe a spear in the other. Pretty cool. I smoked out that one too a couple times. That one's a, a true one. This episode of the podcast is exclusively brought to you by the newly reformulated Jocko Go Energy Drinks. This is my go-to before any podcast, workout. You can say I'm truly addicted to these things. One of the reasons why is I love the flavor profiles, and that is something that the Jocko Fuel team has done to improve Jocko Go Energy Drinks. They have completely reformulated the flavor system while staying true to the ethos of making the cleanest, healthiest energy drink possible. This is truly my go-to above all other energy drinks. I honestly don't even drink any other because of all the BS that's in them. Jocko Go energy drinks are naturally caffeinated, sugar-free, keto, and paleo-friendly. There are no artificial colors, sweeteners, or flavors. It is packed full of B12, B6 vitamins, electrolytes, natural caffeines, amino acids, and nootropics. So if you need some alpha GPC in your life to help you crush it like I do, then go check out Jocko Go. There is a multitude of different flavors, but some of my favorites right off the bat are the Afterburner Orange, Whoop-Ass Watermelon, Citrus Psycho are my go-tos. Oh yeah, and I can't leave out the Sour Apple Sniper. 
Each one of these energy drinks only has 10 calories and gets you focused and in the right mindset to tackle whatever you need to do on a daily basis. One of the best things about this product that I really like, if you look at all of their energy drinks, there is a ton of preservatives in them. There are no preservatives. This is a pasteurized product. Now, this is just one of the amazing products available at Jocko Fuel. If you're looking for a force multiplier and no matter what you're trying to crush, simply visit JockoFuel.com and you can find everything that you need there. Now, here's the best part. Because you're listening to this podcast right now and Jocko Fuel is such an amazing sponsor, they are offering you as the listener 10% off your entire order Every time that you visit Jocko Fuel, if you enter TMS10 at checkout, you're going to get 10% off your entire order every time that you visit JockoFuel.com. If you're too lazy to type in JockoFuel.com, there is a link in the show notes wherever you're listening to this podcast right now. Simply click that. It's going to take you right to JockoFuel.com. And don't forget to use promo code TMS to save 10% off your entire order Every time that you visit, get your mindset and energy on and enjoy the rest of the episode. New as of today. Let's see. Did some cool. Uh, yeah, that one's rad. The engraving is pretty rad. That is so cool. I wonder how many times this was used. I know. Man. You know, I just want to like attach something to it, pull it up on the screen and know how many dudes heads it's lopped into or. You know, the ceremonies it's done and the years, the hands, you know, how many people used it. The history would be so cool. There is some on those websites when they do estate sales or Western type sales. They kind of put all that stuff together. I use iCollector.com. And then there's like Western, there's art, there's also stuff. And they'll be like, okay, when they have enough items, like a Western or Native American stuff in house, they'll do like this auction and it's like, you know, start bidding. So you can just bid through. It's insane. Some, I mean, there's like, my buddy got like a seven and a half foot Crow Indian coup stick from a chief. It really? wasn't from the chief. It's like stuff that, I don't know, Pull like that estate mic, sales. Just a little... It's all good. Like estate sales, you know, kids aren't interested in going back to their parents' estate in Montana. And they're like, yeah. yo, sell it all at estate sales. So they value wow. it and put it up. And there's cool jewelry and art. And I have a few other pieces of art on the wall from that. I got that Tim Cox, the one behind my, my dresser, that to uh The one Cowboys. with the elk in it? Yeah. yeah. I got that for like three grand off that thing. And really? I mean, those Tim Cox, like they go yeah. for a while. He's old school, old timer, like cool stuff. man. Awesome collection, man. Yeah. Every time I get it, I get, <laughs> I'm like, wow. And I see a new one. I'm like, man, I don't have that one. I get a few as gifts too. I probably should give some more away. Get too many. And then people's birthdays come up. I gotta be like, right. They're like, oh, you made this? I'm like, no, I didn't make this one. But it's, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's rad. Well, it's good to see you, man. You too, buddy. It's been a minute. A little over yeah. a year, I think. Yeah. Something like that. And uh, we're coming up on 100 episodes. So I was like, that's cool. Fuck, man, I got to get one of the, like somebody I want to hang out with, number one. And number two was, you know, somebody that's been the most downloaded. And you're definitely there, dude. I had no idea. I mean, I knew how many people loved your blades and stuff but like the cult following that you have basically just because of that is incredible that's cool you got so a lot like, of reach yeah, it's so just a tool but we crushed cool. it on on that but cool. more importantly i wanted to just come down and hang out man like i don't go very many places we did a lot when we first started yeah. to record but i always enjoy coming here for stuff like this right there's yeah. so much cool stuff going on so here. much cool stuff to see it's wild too you know over a hundred episodes, how much love and support that we've got. That's like, great. How long have you been doing it? When, when, what year was the first episode? We started, God, it was right after the pandemic. Like I was, had all the equipment uh, yeah. and was putting everything together like prior to that and was going to start it pre pandemic. Yeah. And then we started, I think the first episode was in 2020, uh, okay. like March or April, somewhere okay. in there. Yeah, so. you hadn't, I mean, it's not that old, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's cool. And it's, it's cool because I've made so many relations, like forged so many relationships yeah. out of it, you know, too. Yeah. So that's yeah, but you've got some, super some good people on, you know, some influential people, a lot of people with cool backgrounds. Yeah, I'm trying to keep it that way, too. And, 
I want to thank you too for helping me vet some of those people like yeah. Tyler Sharp and yeah. some of those dudes that you kind of turned me on are yeah. super rad people yeah. doing they incredible stuff. Cool history, like the traveling they've done, what they've learned, what they're working on now is always, you know, those guys are always super interesting on it. They're just characters with a lot of knowledge and passion, you know? Yeah. That's how I got introduced to Matt as well, helping us out here. So mm, I love that guy. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it's uh, it's cool, man. I, I value time a lot more now because of this, right? Because I never really realized how special time was, and being able to sit down with somebody, you know, like when I walked in the door here, everybody's busy, everybody's on their phone. Some people lost their phone, like you know, it's just it's the world that we're living in, and I don't think that on. there's. This is a much more genuine way to sit down and just sure. like chilling, actually talk you know i'm i feel super fortunate and just blessed for all that so Same thanks here. for everybody that supported me along the way and you as well so, yeah man i'm, I'm blessed you know i wouldn't we had a good i don't do podcasts very much you know and i get bugged to do them quite a bit so like occasionally here and there it's like all right i'll do one and you know with good people and talk about good things so it's been a it's, it's been all right yeah <laughs> <laughs> i had a great time last time with you you know so yeah no it turned into a, a marathon, actually, right? Yeah, yeah. that was fun. No, it was, a, it was definitely a good time. What have you been up to lately, man? I know you're just getting back from a couple mountain trips, right? Yeah. You're doing some tax stuff? Or? Yeah, I went up to uh, Park City a weekend before last. Uh, quick trip. Did some shooting with friends up there. And then uh, the Big Sky trip is really real special. That place is just really incredible up there in Montana, you know. And and uh, that's when like guys like John Dudley and stuff can chill out and we we get up early and go up and hit the mountain before everybody else and, you know, give each other shit and shoot arrows and uh, barbecue and hang out in the afternoons and evenings. And with uh, with that, the Protect guys came up, prior SEAL buddies, and, and they're good friends. I met through them. Uh, they started a company, and uh, which I'm doing ambassadorship for and and uh, really believe in what they're doing. So those guys had come up, and we spent time with them. And uh, it's, it's a rad weekend. I would like to do that every year with, with that group. Sounds super rad. Was it a was that attack event that you yeah. were at? Okay, yeah, both, cool. of them. both of them. Yeah, the the uh, Park City. That's a, obviously a cool place too. So climbing around those mountains. Generally, like there's five courses each. There's some shorter courses you shoot, and then the longer course are you know four to four and a half to five and a half miles, twenty twenty five different targets. Which is right. what's the longest shot in there? Oh man, I think there's some hundred and ten oh, you know wild. yard ones. Yeah, there's a uh, John Dudley has like the knock course, knock on course, and he he puts like a big, huge, you know, green Bigfoot out there, really okay. far out, and <laughs> challenges people to hit it and does cool. That's stuff. awesome. So yeah. it's not like a snowshoe hair I, or something. Trust me, there's hundred, some, you, oh yeah, yeah, there's some there's some shots and you're like, oh, are you kidding me, man? Like it's a, a it's like a mini elk, like it's like this big. It's a mini oh, el elk at like forty five fifty yards, you know, and you're like, oh man, That's you lose a lot of bullets. Out. Or bullets. You lose lose a lot of arrows yeah. out there. I do at least. <laughs> I do too as well, man. Like uh I haven't I've never shot tack, but where I shoot at where I was yeah. talking to you about yeah, trying yeah. to get you to come up at American Bowman, you know, I think the furthest shot there is maybe seventy yards or yeah. something. But there's they some have, easier courses and some tougher courses out there. You know. You know which ones like prime. And you can kind of pick your cut. level, right? Yeah, like when you go and you sign up online, um, you you do your knock times and you do what course you want to do. So there's a little, you know, minor courses, and then you have like Sitka is always a really gnarly course. Prime is usually a tough course. Knock on course a little tougher than the other courses. Right on. It's still on my list to do. I was gonna go to Sunlight Mountain this year, but then just didn't. It's good. You learn. I mean, not that you, you kind of you just learn a lot. It's so many different angles and distances and. Um, really by the time you do two or three courses, you're like, wow, I'm way more comfortable to shoot out 50, 60, 70 yards at, at a full size elk. Cause you shoot these little targets at those distances. So when you get an, you know, a full size elk at 75, 80 yards, you're, you you know, after shooting 50 different targets, you know what I mean? <laughs> if your bow is dialed, you get right. a little more confidence in your shot. Yeah. When I, that's the whole reason I go to American Bowman twice a week is I, it's, all up and downhill shooting, yeah. right? Like yeah. there's maybe one or two flat targets out of 40 targets. 
and that is so much better than just standing on polished concrete, you know, flinging yeah. arrows down it. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, some circles. So I enjoy going up there, and it's yeah, good me for too. me mentally, dude. A lot of times I go up there because it's a private, it's private land. Yeah, there's nobody ever on it, man. Yeah. It's like you're up there by yourself. Yeah. So it's quiet, good way to connect. Yeah, that's good. Super cool, man. A lot of the guys from you know former veterans and stuff especially with tac and everything it seems like there's a huge veteran community there yeah like yeah i think you know the outdoor community it probably is pretty attractive to a lot of veterans at least the veterans i know you know i obviously can't say that for everybody but there's a very large amount of prior special operations dudes you know team guys i know that do a lot of outdoor you know stuff whether rock climbing you know hunting whether it's bow or rifle um some some with uh, getting away from a bunch of people maybe you don't like the normal day to day grind getting out there having a little peace uh, but also challenging yourself you know what I mean so I think yeah. it's attractive to people like that and I think that there's a little bit of that like gearing up too right like it's kind of about yeah having some you get gear to really go hunt. like cool gear like you what know. you do what you build yeah, you know always so. like that always got to have cool gear Enjoy hunting stuff. yeah. Uh, you got any hunts lined up, you know, spending yeah. some time shooting and stuff? Yeah, so I'll head to, uh, I'll be heading back to Alaska this year again. I failed last year in getting a moose, so I can't stop at that. So I gotta, I'm heading back up. I'll take my bow and my rifle. I'm ambassador for Christians in Arms, so I've got a couple real, real nice guns from them. So my 300 PRC is dialed in. I'll head up there the August 26th, meet up with my buddy Matt DeLuca, grew up there, big hunter, that's who I go with, and we'll take an airplane out probably 28th, get dropped off the Alaska range, and then, I mean, cross my fingers, do our best, and see if we can get a few animals down, maybe a moose, caribou, and bears up there, so if we can get a few animals, we'll get picked up, fly the meat back, or fly the meat back, come back out, pick us up. So I'll stay up there as long as I can, it's just a one-way ticket for now. What, uh, is this your first moose hunt or no I went last year okay yeah we just did you get it, anything last no, year no yeah it was cold and freezing cold and saw I mean th saw three grizzlies like 25 black bears saw this you know doll sheep up on the mountainside getting dive bombed by an eagle trying to knock it off the cliff really you know, it was cool yeah it, it, that's wild the doll sheep was way too big to get knocked off that cliff but it was cool to watch that aggressive eagle after it you know and it's cool. I love it up there. My my buddy, like I said, lives up there, and uh, he's got this beautiful house right outside of Anchorage, up on the hill, and just in his backyard. We just put the spotting scope out and look all over and see bears and moose. And you had any you close know. encounters up there? Or? Uh, no, not too close. I mean, they've come fairly close, but no, no, not getting any char charged yeah. or anything like that yet. No. Do you carry anything for oh, yeah, protection? I, yeah, yeah, I don't mind. That's land sharks to me. I'm scared yeah. of sharks in the ocean. <laughs> um, absolutely. I, you know, I carry like a, my 10 millimeter Glock and I, I usually have those a, too, a, man. you know, 300 PRC or okay. something, something big on me yeah. as well. Yeah, no, you got to kind of have it. For, the grizzly scare me. Black bears, not as yeah, much, but even, I mean, up where I'm at, there's the bears don't get hunted. So they get, yeah. fucking there's so big, many, there's dude. so many uh, yeah. black bears in Colorado. I see almost as many there when I'm hunting on the north side of flat tops. Oh. You know, they're everywhere. They're thick but, you know, every time I elk hunt there, I buy, I usually, you know, buy a bear tag as well. So yeah, and it, I mean, you, the add-on is so easy now. Yeah. Like yeah, you can for, get a bear uh, tag for any area. It's like yeah, for I think you know for out of state uh, non-residents, probably seven hundred fifty bucks for elk tag. It's like four hundred bucks, four hundred fifty bucks for a bear tag. Right. So like, shoot bears too while you're out there. It's yeah. too many. You know. Yeah, I think for me being in state, it's only like fifty bucks yeah, or something. I'm it's sure. not even; it's thirty five dollars. Probably get or like, something like you probably that. get antelope, bear, elk, mule deer all for the same price or something. Forty yeah. bucks for all or something. Moose is the only thing I think yeah, that's still kind of up there. Yeah. yeah, and the bighorns are. Yeah, yeah, that is wild, man. That's like once in a lifetime. Yeah, with uh, if you're Alaskan resident, you can hunt doll pretty often. I think uh, bear is. Every five years, you can hunt every other year, and then if you get one, it's like every five years, you can get a big brown bear. Black bears, like, you can like five of them if you're a resident. It's pretty wild. What does it take to get your moose tag up in Alaska? Is Over it, the counter. It's easy, huh? Yeah, so so the only two tags you need a guide for are mountain goat and brown bear or grizzly. Um, outside that, it's over the counter. You can do it yourself. 
you know. Luckily, my buddy yeah. is there. Twenty years he's been hunting there, so. So you got the scouting you know, the most down expensive, and everything. You know, most expensive stuff is getting out, the, taking a small plane out, dropping you off. Right. You know, you're you're paying a bit for that, but. Yeah, I'd imagine. In the middle of nowhere, you know, and animals are being pushed. I I want to see a wolverine, so that's a, so that's a goal. Oh, those year. things are They're super rad. wild. I I have seen one in Montana, like that's northern cool. Montana, when I was a kid, and. I we'll still like would love to run across one of those things. Yeah, again. They are they so see them pretty nasty, often. Man. My buddies see them almost every hunting trip, but I haven't seen one yet. So, are they still on the endangered list, or no, can you they, hunt them? You can hunt they're them. They trap predator. them. They hunt them. Really? Yeah. yeah, I probably wouldn't. Those things are too cool. Yeah, you know. Could you imagine trapping one of those things and not like having to? I don't know how you open that cage back up and. You know what I mean? Be like, hey man, like we're gonna have to kill it. I'm not letting this thing out. Yeah. It's gonna, it's gonna look at me and recognize me and come down to California, and fuck me up. Dude. Right. <laughs> My That's buddies wild. last time they said they saw two, um, two of them. They were just fighting and fighting and fighting and running. And they said they watched them all day long, just run to the top of these steep mountains, across the ridge, down, fight, back up. And they were like, they just never ran out of steam. They're just all always day. pissed, right? I like, guess so. Yeah. Man. Wow, they need to brush yeah. their teeth. <laughs> what, uh, have you, you've hunted a bison before, haven't you? Like, that's a bucket list hunt for me. And yeah, but I mean, it's not like it's like high fence hunts, you know, 10,000 acres in Texas, and they're not, they're not scared. It's like hunting cows, right? I did it for the meat, you know what I mean? That's exactly what I'm going to do it for. I mean, I'd love to go on like a timber bison hunt, like somewhere yeah. up in Alaska or, yeah. or something like that, or even. I think it'd be cool to draw a tag. I've put in for it for a few years outside of Yellowstone or uh, Grand Tetons there, okay, whatever yeah, the elk refuge is because yeah. they're still kind of, they're wild, I guess. Yeah. 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 They're free range anyway. So. Yeah. I mean, they're such big beasts. It's like, they're not scared of much. So no, that'd yeah, be cool to do. Yeah. I'd like to, I, I'd like to do another one for the meat. You know, I just got to start eating more food out of my freezers and creating. Oh man. I my freezer's done. My freezer sucks. Full. I'm having to buy beef for the first time this year, but oh, it's man. just because I've been on a gnarly diet lately too. So that's been that's good. Fucking crazy. I need to start but, sharing sharing all my wild game. Yeah. I, have, I have one that's just like all elk. Another one's like you know some pig off my buddy's farm and some chunks of wagyu and stuff like that that I like. And another one's just all bluefin tuna f- from catching out here. You know. Yeah, that's wild. What I I see your pictures all the time. Are you out spear fishing or is this? So like- I have spear fished. Um, that's a goal of mine here. So I've been regular fishing more out here, just you know deep sea fishing. But I got a good buddy uh, who we do this this dive nice with uh, kinetic spear fishing. So he's still active. He builds you know just badass guns, and he's he is very good at what he does. And he also does charters out of here for spear fishing. And right now I just was on my phone earlier and. Um, I mean, there's some big bluefin coming in, big schools. There's a guy who flies in these spots and gives a little information out of where those are. And there's some, you know, there's some two to 300 pounders out there wow. ripping around. So, you know, I think so they, they get one, you know, the guy Blake, he crushes it. He gets one every week at least. If he wants to go more, he can get more. He's just that good at it. Tune every night. Yeah. I'm Shishimi, like, yeah, well, huh? Like, dude, I mean, we do, we'll do like wild game night. Another one of my buddies loves spearfishing Colton and, uh, he would be like, he's a good cook too. And he'll be like, wild game night and I'll bring the fish. So he'll bring fresh, you know, when he kills one, he'll bring that. I'll pull, you know, elk out. I got some buffalo in there. I got some yak in there, you know, and I'll pull that stuff out and I'll thaw that. He'll come over with it and he's making, you know, sashimi and rolls and I'm doing strips of, you know, wagyu and, you know, buffalo. And we just do some cool wild game dinners at the house. It's, it's like fun. the best of both worlds yeah. right there. Yeah. Surf and turf, right? It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Mountains and sea, or whatever yeah. you want to call it. Yeah, and that's fucking rad. That's a good time. So, being out and spearing one of those things, and I'm super curious on this just because I've never done it. Like, I've done some, uh, is it Hawaiian sling where yeah. it's like the rubber band that yeah. goes around? Like, yeah. I've done a little bit of that, never in the ocean. We used to do it up in northern Montana, like in some of the lakes up yeah. there for salmon and sure. you know, bull trout and stuff like that. And that was kind of a wild ride. So, like, once you spear it, you have to hold on to pound it. Tuna. Yeah, you're like, not holding what on to you... it. So you know, I have two kinetic guns. They have the attachments to do the to do the breakaway to floats. Um, mm-hmm. The two I have, I went to Marea, and then uh, yeah, that was the way I took them. Marea, just and you get some good sized fish, but you're holding on them. And there's a reel on the bottom. Mm. So the big guns they use, there's an attachment. You shoot it, and it's a breakaway. When it takes off, it breaks away from the gun. That doesn't gun doesn't go with it. It goes to floats. 
Mm. So when it drags the floats down, that wears them out. And then you pull them up, shoot them again. So is there a particular spot that you're aiming for? I mean, like you want to dome, you want to dome them. So if you yeah. if you're able to dome, hit the brain, then it stuns them, and then they just sit there and float. If you don't do that, I mean, they're just taken off. They're gone, huh? Yeah, so they're and they're just, so fast. It's nuts. I mean, there's videos if you look at that kinetic uh, kinetic spearfish on Instagram where yeah, I you know, follow those guys, it's and he does sick. like you know first person shooting them. You sometimes he dives down and it's just he's looking left to right and it's just all just a massive school of bluefin, and you're like. And there's tons of schools like that. There's a lot of them out there. And he'll wow. be like, mm, bink. And he's chill. He's doing a two-minute breath hold. And, you know, and he's, he starts swimming up. And you'll see, like, three floats just disappear after that thing, like pulling those things down, you know, 250-pound bluefin. Wow. And then, I mean, once you spear one, you're basically chumming the water, right? So what is uh, – I, I don't know how – those sharks? guys don't see sharks very much. Really? You know, there's definitely sharks out there. There was a video in La Jolla like a week ago, and it's like a 12-foot great white swims by this dude who's spearfishing right in La Jolla. He's like spearfishing like this, and he looks up, and this 12-foot great white's like, Meh, turns. I was like, oh, my God. There's some <laughs> children in the – there's some – I mean, they're not children. There's some people going to get eaten sooner or later. Yeah. Last year, they t were taking great whites right off Coronado, and there's a video of guys like – you know, getting up and tagging, you know, six, seven foot great whites. And it's like, oh, yeah, we tagged a bunch. Like, what's a bunch? Like, oh, there was, we think we saw six. We only were able to tag four in that murky water. And I was like, yeah. I mean, I don't know why bud students are getting their legs yeah. eaten off. It's just a matter of time, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that fucking scares the shit yeah, out of me, dude. Like, like grizzlies and, yeah. I don't know if sharks, I'd rather man. fight a grizzly or a shark. That's a tough one. It depends what they have on. I you. think it grizz, man. Just put an S vest on and be like, yeah. come on, boy. <laughs> Take us both out. Have you seen uh, the trailer for the movie Prey yet? Um, which is that? So I, mean, I think it's a Hulu exclusive deal, but it's the Predator. But they that chick? It's yeah, like and it's got a girl. native influence. Somehow this 100-pound soaking wet native American girls hunting... <laughs> These futuristic predators. warriors, predators. Yeah. It's not quite I, I Schwarzenegger, it. but I know. Well, you know, it's the whole like. Uh, Did you see the whole thing? Women are as strong as men, even if they have 150 pound difference. Right. And not even the same skill set, but hey, it's a movie. Right? I watched right. it. I'll watch it when it yeah. comes out. You know, I may wait till it goes to yeah to Netflix. Looks or pretty something. sweet. The only thing that I don't know, I didn't understand how they were drawing their bows. They were drawing them like backwards or something i was like ah oh. and being an archer i picked that out right away i was like ah oh, yeah at least it. you know at least do it realistic yeah you know people want to create something weird like oh they, they let's make it look really funky you know to like for it what? almost like, looks like there's a way to do things thumb, right at least right like, like upside yeah, down yeah. pulling back yeah there's some odd stuff do you ever yeah. see that show is it c and everybody's blind with jason momoa no i don't think you so. seen that matt it's it's wild. And it's called the sea, like S E E. Everyone's blind. It's like the future, post apocalyptic. But somehow in post, you know, like post apocalyptic, everybody's like using sticks again. And you're like, ah, what? man, I don't know. It's kind of like <laughs> bow and arrows again. And you're like, there'd be a, there's a lot of weapons in this country. You probably break into every other house and at least get some guns and ammo. Yeah, it's you know wild. I mean? I mean, there's more guns than there are people. I hope I so. There's probably way yeah. more. It's I mean, I have four to one. Yeah, you know, crazy. Craziness, that man. is wild. All the hunting that you've done or been able to do in the last couple of years, do you have a favorite? Like, I mean, do you enjoy coming elk hunting? To uh, elk hunting's that's my, my favorite, too. man. That's like beautiful. Like, I hunt. I've been lucky and, and blessed enough to hunt on the north side of the flat tops up there. There's some guys in um, in Texas that bought a big ranch up there, and they're part of uh, American Warrior Association, a nonprofit. And my good buddy, I was in the SEAL teams with uh, Big Will Spencer. He's a retired master chief. He's the head of the the nonprofit, so they get together up there. I get to get out there in the woods and hunt with them. And there's people who donate to the foundation that fly up there, and we'll go hunt with them and and call for them, and you know, spend the evenings with those guys and bring a chef in and cook. And it's been really cool to be able to get out with those guys and and a hunt. But man, being able to go out and call and hear the hear the elk and you know 
spot in stock or sit there and it, the it's weather, such a beautiful everything like, twenty two thousand acre ranch that's wow. it's the one of the coolest places I've ever been, best ranches I've ever been. It's beautiful. The bulls get pretty big up there too. Yeah, there's some there's some good sized bulls. Um I mean I've seen like fifteen bulls in one afternoon, you know, just all different sizes. And there's some good sizes. I've seen some seven by sevens, a lot of good size five by si- fives. You know, I think that the ranch was a a little abused prior to them buying it by some outfitters. You know what I mean? That it, originally I think it was owned by an energy company because there's some caves and some shale, and uh, they kind of just used it for some of the big wigs there to go hunt, and they leased it to some hunting outfitters, and I think those guys kind of took advantage of it. But uh, there's so many elk. Now you know we're p- particular with what we shoot, and if there's some bigger ones, you let them sit, and you know some ones with bad you know and messed up uh antlers take those out of the breeding pool and like it's just getting better every year and you know didn't hunt a whole lot during covid generally when we're up there i mean maybe we get four to six elk and there's 3500 you know maybe 1500 bulls on the ranch just bouncing around and there's not obviously it's not high fence they can go onto the public land but it it would take a lot wilderness area there that's like right that's to the wet to the to the east, there's a small wilderness area. The thing is, for hunters to try to get behind it, it's tough. They have to come all the way through the bottom, through the flat top wilderness, and uh, whatever pressure is created down there just pushes the elk up and then down into their land. And their elk, those elk are like, there's 33 ponds, there's creeks. They're like, we love this area. We're gonna stick water. Around. Oh yeah, cover. it's amazing. They're not a lot of That's hunting. Incredible. Yeah. So yeah, even when we hunt it with man. rifles, we hunt suppressed on it. So really, yeah. That's right. It's a good place, man. I love it. I love. Yeah. Col- I like Colorado. Yeah, no, I've, this is the whole reason I moved back there, man. I'd grown up there and stuff. I didn't appreciate it as much as I should have, I don't think. And, you know, after going around the world and seeing a bunch of different places, it was like, okay, yeah. it's not so fucking bad, man. It's this is cool actually place. the best place. The activities are where it's at. Like, you got those winters where you got great snow and snowmobiling, um, you know, and then you got s- spring that's incredible. It's green all summer. And then you get the cool colors and you got, Everything from whitewater rafting to fly fishing to normal fishing to backpacking, camping, hunting. It's it's all there, man. Mountain so, biking. Yeah, I mean, mountain it's, biking. Oh, yeah. There's, I just started that There's again. so many hobbies that you can it's get amazing. into, man. It's amazing. It's crazy. Love and it. not even hobbies. They're like outdoor. Right. It keeps people sports. healthy. Yeah. You know, like there's plenty of stuff to get outside and do. Yeah. It's hard to pick and choose, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, elk hunting is probably... I mean, I don't really ever leave Colorado in September. That's yeah. why I don't go hunt in Alaska yeah. and stuff. It's like, that's what I enjoy to yeah. do the most. And I enjoy doing it there the most. Like, it would be awesome or epic to go on an elk hunt in Utah or something, you know, for some of those. Well, like, you know, spots, Utah but, would look so similar. Right. It's like. It's pretty much the same damn yeah, thing. Right? You know, I, I went to hunt it in Montana and I, Montana is beautiful, you know, but, you know, once spring ends, it's, it's gray. It's like. Right. You know, it's not super green. You wait until the fall, you get some cool colors, you know, but and they don't have and then it's cold. trees up there too. Right. Then it gets cold and it's like, and then like you got to put in for, you know, instead of over the counter. So, yeah. And you don't get landowner tags up there. So like Colorado, right. you go to a ranch like that 20,000 acre ranch and they're like, oh, hey, we got 16 landover tags or don't quote me on how many, but you get a lot. Yeah. You know, and they're like, hey, there's 16 for your ranch. When you uh, shot your bison, how much meat did you get off of it? You think? wasn't a bit real big bison uh man she shoot a cow or bull? you know what we shot three uh a bull i shot a small bull we shot three in total so i think they just divided the meat up okay uh one of them was pregnant which you couldn't tell you know oh, they couldn't damn. tell so one was pregnant which like cut it open and it was like probably a week before the baby was gonna be born it's like full hair so i took i did a little cpr just to see if i can get a pet out of the situation well, yeah. i couldn't um so you know we we took the back straps, tenderloins, quartered it out, and, like, we just cooked it that night, like, little... I mean, the, the meat was, like, opaque because it never really? breathed oxygen. So, it, like, just was the it meat good? was, like, that was amazing. It's like sashimi. Uh, yeah. It was good. That's wild. I almost had a pet out of it. That would have yeah. been cool. Like, oh, yeah, I'm going to name you Lucky. <laughs> Coming home with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, I can't imagine... Like, I guess I'm intrigued to hunt a bison because of the native like culture and yeah. what they did and what some of the books that I read and some of the stuff. And I, I don't think it's quite the same as it was, but I genuinely like the meat, like the, it's amazing. Dude, the, 
it's great. back straps or yeah, rib eyes it is, or whatever. It's gone it's, by now. It it's incredible. A little. It's great, great. I prefer food. it over yeah. beef, you know? Yeah. It'd be good to, it'd be cool to do one, you know, every year if you had enough people to feed and just fill a freezer and get all that burger meat, back straps, staked out, ribs, like, it'd be, I'd, I'd like to get one this year still. We'll see. I right. don't have a lot of time. I'd have to do a high fence. If you do a high fence, I think you go year round if you want to do that. But yeah. yeah, that's probably what I'll end up doing. Just a, I don't have the time to get up and do it, and B, it's so much. It's a long process. I'm sure man. it's a draw for those out there, those real wild ones. I'm well, sure even the one in Utah, I've been yeah. putting in for like ten years or oh, something. Yeah. I still have there's one up. There. I forgot the name of the ranch, but it's up by San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara. So there's a ranch up there you can hunt. Hunt them on too. You just contact them. It's, I think, can't remember how much, you know, it's like, it depends on the size too. You want like a trophy size, you want a, right. a large adult for the meat, male. I think so it's, you it's know, like, four to five grand. You can go and shoot one and have it processed and fill your freezers. Right. A cow would be ideal for me because I'm just, I'm not after any yeah. of the trophy. Yeah, you can get, a, you can get a, a cow for the meat. That's what I do. I want to do last year, I want to do kind of do that for the guys where we take a trip, let, mm. you know, you know, whatever, you know get through the guys be like hey who wants to shoot one there from there you know rochambeau i don't care get two <laughs> rock paper scissors two of the guys win they get to sh actually shoot the animal everybody gets to see how it's processed cut up everybody gets in on it that'd be really cool and i'd like to do that for the shop That's and so then rad. all the meat gets divided up boom comes in here everybody gets meat to take home and they're all part of the process and seeing the breakdown would be really cool see how it works yeah. out yeah. yeah that's wild man i like to do that my friend donnie that makes all those stone tools and stuff that I was telling you about. Um, he just got hired by CU, I think it was CU, CU Boulder, uh, to at ladle a bison and then break it down all with stone tools. Jeez. And it, like he's told me the whole process. It is That's gonna take a little insane, time. dude. Yeah. So he processed the whole thing with stone tools. And so then, making scrapers and making his own yeah, skinners. Yeah, knives and... What was he using, like obsidian or something, or was he able to use steel? He has all kinds of different stone, man. Yeah. Like he's he's kind of a hoarder of it, man. Like I guess you know, like oh, he doesn't cool. have a whole lot of material stuff, which is cool. Like yeah. he, I think he was he was a marine, and when he got out, he uh, he had like all this badass stuff, super into rock climbing and all that sort of stuff, and uh, he just decided at some point, like, hey, I want to go more i don't need all this bullshit yeah, right so he sure. just went down to the corner and gave it away to a bunch of homeless dudes and ever since then he's been like wow. on straight primitive and wow yeah he did some walk from northern california to get his first stone so he goes out and like actually harvests his own Probably stone and stuff. you know there's a so there's a building up uh, building there's a uh a little mountain little hill up in napa valley in northern napa valley called glass mountain so the yeah. whole thing is obsidian, which is that black rock. I think he actually up. walked there to get his first. So what's crazy he... is you can you know, you drive by on Glass Mountain Road. You could get out of the car and like you could just kick the leaves over and there's chunks of obsidian. It's absolutely amazing. So that's when I grew up making arrowheads with my older brothers all the so, time. So what's cool is they find that same obsidian from that mountain all over from Arizona to Oregon. Um, so those native people used to travel all the way over there back in the day. And I don't know if the natives there in, in Napa Valley would sell it or give it away or trade, you know what I mean, back in the day. But like I said, they found that same obsidian from up there in Napa Valley all over the West. Yeah, we find it all the time in Colorado, and that's not like a native rock. I think it comes from the yeah. East Coast or the West Coast, yeah. right? It's like a volcanic. Yep. Yeah, and it's so just cool, like glass. man. It, is, it looks just like glass, but it's like black or chunks smoky. Of it. I got chunks of it in my drawer over there somewhere. I actually have a few uh, knives and like arrowheads that we found yeah. like out in South Park. Because yeah. my grandfather was super into that. Like, We would go, I don't know, at least five or six times a summer, like just do a day trip yeah. and just go out and walk these huge prairies, you know, that yeah. were once underwater or whatever so and cool. we would find, find stuff some, dig it up every like, time oh. yeah some that Sometimes are full some a chip, little corner like, yeah a yeah. lot of them are broke but it's cool he has a whole collection i know you're not supposed to do that but i mean man, I, got, I, I got a collection going yeah from all over i've even the way i've gotten the tomahawks off the eye collector they'll have some authentic there's some bs ones in there too but you can right. find authentic really beautiful so ones. rad man yeah that one's cool man super cool so this was on the authentic collector or is it yeah. like, okay. Yeah, that's all, all so that's authentic. cool that you know that you're not buying something that's Yeah, and they'll give full, you paper with, it, with yeah, it and stuff forged. like too. Some yeah. of them, you know, that one, I don't know how much I got that one for, uh, but some of them have like a lot of history, like King George the Fourth gave it to like, you know, a 
Northeast Indian tribes chief and they have all this history and it'll mm -hmm. go for, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars for a for a hawk right. or a hatchet or something cool, you know. I wonder if they could do any forensic like DNA type stuff. It must on be it to how see, they like well, what they'll do is they'll give you the breakdown of like, hey, we know it's from this era for the ones they don't know the exact history. It's from this era. They'll they'll say this is the other tomahawks like it that we know. Boom, boom, boom. So they grade and, it basically. Yeah. 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 Wow. It, it's just wild to me to think about like when I purchased my tomahawk from you. Yeah. I was like, fuck, man, what did I just do? Because like, a, I want to use this. But B, it might send me to prison for life, right? Like, <laughs> depends how you use it, I guess. Right? Yeah. Uh, just the thoughts of, you know, I can't imagine using a tomahawk on somebody. But there yeah, something, you know what I mean? Like those guys use their tomahawks for everything. It wasn't just an instrument right. of war. You know, they had a knife and a tomahawk, so you're using it for hunting purposes and protection purposes. You know, they didn't have three different tomahawks for ones for heads and ones for bellies and ones for animals, you know? So they use the shit out of them and sharpen them and use the shit out of them. Yeah. It's a tool. I think, uh, the influence that you've carried over from that culture into this is into what you do at half face blades is incredible, man. Like it's like that Western yeah. native, you know, like, and going back to something like, if you look at how this is crafted, I mean, this isn't like super thin, replaceable blade or right. anything like this. This was like purpose built to last for yeah. hundreds and, of years. You know, right? if you crack that handle, like they can just make a new grip. Right. And they would, you know, make them ornate. That one's got some little metal things. They'd put these little, you know, little brass divots on them and, you know, you make it yours. Like they would right. customize their customize their own tools back in the day, which is cool. And put different feathers and different meanings and different symbols on them, you know. They take someone's life, they put a, their symbol on it. and Notch or yeah, whatever, yeah. yeah. That's where they're all a little different. They're yeah. all cool. How much have you, I mean, with all the influence and the way that you've done it, how much have you read into, like, history on some of the stuff? Like, I know that you have, like, the Crow Scout. And yeah. The, you mentioned that on the last podcast uh, that we did that you might have a, a little bit of Crow in you. And, <sighs> Who knows? You know, it's, I yeah. mean, that 23 and me says it's minimal, and I'm like, man... That's that's all right. I think you that know. they can do one that actually finds native blood. Yeah, it might but. be something to do. But um, I I mean I used to read a whole lot more uh, books, you know, about you know Chief Red Cloud and and uh, Joe Medicine Man and you know all the stuff with Custer and the Crow Scouts that worked along with the U.S. military and stuff like that. So I've, I've been a history buff, um, even though I forget shit. You know, my mind isn't what it used to be, but. I continue, I'll start something and then I'll get busy and I have to go back and finish it. When I do long drives, I'll listen to another book and uh, listen to some of the Comanches and you know some of the history of those guys and Apaches. And They talk about tools a little bit. It's more of their exploits and right. their bad battles and stuff like that. So, yeah. you know, I like that. I like the Western, obviously the Western and Native culture. I really, you know, when when the settlers were pushing west and carving you know their homes out of the land is using primitive tools to build their log homes and axes and working together and living that that's a tough tough life the winters and that's pretty rad to me like how tough we used to be you know what i mean right i mean way different lifestyle to begin with yeah. right like yeah. from where we're at now it's yeah. incredible to I me mean, yeah. if, if i could have been you know, a bird sitting on Lewis and Clark Lewis's shoulder or something and seeing, imagine coming, you know, over the mountains in Montana and the hills and looking at the prairie and being like, what the fuck is that? And it's, you know, millions. Seeing a grizzly bear right. for the first time. Think of how many back in the day there were. I mean, look at the amount of bison, right? And then like grizzlies there every day they're coming across elk and grizzlies and wolverines and like they must have just been like this is the coolest shit I've ever seen. And hopefully my musket stays dry. Right. You know? Like it's <laughs> gunpowder. <laughs> Just yeah, I didn't think that. about that. Oh, just yeah. incredible. Eagles all over. They're fishing in the creek. There's, you know, trout and brown trout. Imagine the first, you know, 10-pound brown trout. Undisturbed, so, right? Too. Yeah. Like, yeah. Just be incredible. I think the closest that I've ever come to, like, undisturbed country is being up in northern Montana. You know, I've never been out in the backcountry in Alaska yeah. yet. It's a It's a bucket list for me for sure, but, like, there were times when we were, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten miles in on 
glaciated peaks, you know, going over some stuff into like Black Lake and some of these spots and, you know, year round glacier in there. And the deer just had no idea what you were. They were like, like what the fuck is this, man? So like, cool. yeah, like does not even spooked yeah. or anything, you know? So, yeah. Imagine, you know, back in the day, animals wouldn't know what to think. Like, right. Uh, maybe that's not a threat, you know? Yeah. Pretty wild. It is wild. We lose a camera, Matt. Hey, all good. It's going to happen. Where were we at? What were we t- uh, fucking talking about? All sorts of stuff. We were talking about native culture and yeah. that sort of stuff. Influ- so. The influence it has, you know, on, on uh, you know, the blades we make. And I just come, you know, from a, a very outdoor family and outdoor brothers. We used to make arrowheads. I remember taking old leaf springs and grinding those a little bit as a kid. We probably talked about this before. And, yeah. you know, getting to go back and do that same thing again was pretty cool. And. Like I said, being an end user, um, it's been the biggest blessing, you know, secondary to having a great team and, and great customers, of course, but sure. being able to know what, you know, what works, what doesn't work is great. This is pretty wild. The last podcast that we did was on wildland fires. Um, and it was, it was awesome, man. The guy that's been on all kinds of different hell attack and engine companies and stuff, but Prior to that, I was doing some homework, like just reading up on stuff. And I wanted to know how the natives kind of taught fire and fire mitigation and that sort of stuff. And they used to like burn like some tribes, right? There's this tribe. uh, I think it was the, I'm going to butcher this, the Pinu tribe, Pinu, somewhere up in Northern Montana. Fire was so sacred to them that they would take like a buffalo horn, right? Or a black horn. And they would inlay clay in it somehow or something like that and then they would turn it into like almost like a satchel or something that they could carry yeah but they would never put their fire out so it was the Keep same fire that they had for thousands of years right imagine or ever however long they were around They're like damn this river what are we gonna do like yeah we gotta- well they had multiple the like the fire carriers yeah. were like these sacred dudes and i guess they were like these badasses that would run 50 yeah, cool. to 60 miles in a day so like imagine a- running out and like the fear that you're never gonna see it again it's all your oh warmth it's God. how you yeah. cook food and you know yeah and i think it was like part of it was a spiritual thing. So it like kept your ancestry growing and like it went so fucking deep, man. It was super cool. Fire was probably given to them by, you know, their ancestors that are still out there watching out for it. It totally was. It was sacred for sure. There was one guy that like, you can't get drunk, you know, you gotta, you gotta man the fire. Like they were on literal fire watch, you know, so they put stuff in there and they just keep it smoldering. So it never goes out. Right. And then they would, they were talking about, you can take like an Aspen tree conch, it's like those big knots sure. and that stuff will burn for a really long time. So they would take some of that or from a birch tree sure. if they were down in Colorado, cause they were mi- migratory, right? Yeah. So they were going wherever their food source was. And, uh, so yeah, they would carry it and then they might have to stop somewhere in between, make a fire right. and then Keep re it going. Right. That's cool. And they were kind of like scouts. They would go out and find, they would scout for game or new camps, right? Where the tribe was packing up and women and children were moving and they were moving their teepees and all that sort of stuff. But it was just super cool. And they said that these dudes would run, you know, over some of that country up there, you know, 50 miles a day carrying this fire to get there and like get the fire going before the rest of the tribe shows up, you know, like it's pretty wild. That's it was awesome. something I I dove down like a deep yeah. rabbit hole in that. And uh, yeah, I just thought it was That's super cool. crazy. I had never heard that before yeah. or anything like that. I never really thought about sense. the meaning. But what it came down to and how I stumbled across it is I was looking at how how back then, you know, they didn't have forestation or, or any sort of mitigation or anything to, to lightning clean the forest. Would burn the forest. So they would actually burn. Back burn or... They would burn before they left. So wherever they were camped at, yeah. they would set it on fire before they left. So when they came back. It was regrowth or something. It was regrowth, That's yeah. Cool. Look at the nitrogen in the soil. And if you've ever hunted around any like wild burns or anything, like, like the elk and deer, they love being right on the burn scar, right? Because there's so much nutrients yeah. where that stuff is burned. So yeah, it made a lot of sense. All the underbrush regrows, all that greenery pops up again, you know. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of that in the world. There's a big fire. 
Yeah. Up uh, near Yosemite, I think, right now. Big, big, big fire right now. But, I mean, that's, that's crazy. The amount of fire. We need the them. I years. mean, I hate to say that, but we need, we water. need them. We need the water, water research that I did. Yeah. Yeah. All these signs down here, like going down the five and stuff, extreme drought, do Save not water. water. Like, yeah. Yeah, they're trying to ruin everything. Yeah, that's wild. There's some, there's, uh, there's, I'm sure there's more to it than just people <laughs> using water, you know? Right. So back into some of the native influence that's in some of the blades. You know, these things are amazing. That's, it, it's incredible what you've come up with and what you've built, right? From a business standpoint as well. But I love the design of everything, right? Yeah. Like they're purpose built for specific yeah. things, I guess you could say. Purpose or driven, purpose driven yeah. tools, you know? Yeah. That we can get as simple as somebody wants or as we want, or uh, it's Art, intricate, you artistic know, and personalized. Too, right? yeah. 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 That's a fun. That's a fun yeah, part. We Seeing got a bunch of stuff. And... I asked you to lay a bunch of stuff out here. Yeah. So I'd love to go through, you know, each one of these and kind of yeah. see. Because sometimes I don't know the purpose of what you. Sure. Well, I mean, the there's some that cross were. over. There's some that cross over between tactical and outdoor as well. Some are, sure. you know, much more the shape, the design, the thickness, the type of steel, uh, you know, is a little the, the purpose driven portion of it is like, hey, more outdoor, more skinning. Uh, combatives, tactical, concealable, obviously chef knives, chef li knives, you know, t utility knives, tomahawks with a spike, tomahawks without, you know, uh, the shape of a tomahawk, you know, like if I'm genuinely, if, uh, if I want a tactical tomahawk, you know, that spike is great. And then if it's something I'm going to be using back country or, you know, I want a hammer on one side of it and I can hammer things, I can hammer tent stakes, you know, that's, what's nice about it. Um, little pry bar on the bottom. So, I mean, I guess, you know, from I'm just working on kind of redesigning the Skinner. So we got a medium. Is that a lightweight? No. So this is the exact handle, like the feather light, but it's my new Skinner. So I haven't even put, in, I put one of each, a large one and a small junior out. So this is the new junior wow. Skinner. He's nice That's and thin wicked, steel. man. Just a cool little, pretty classic skinning design. Like, you know, you can come up with new designs, but a lot of people are like, they just get way too insane with the design because they want it to be so different. And I'm like, there's a reason why, like there's this belly here. There's a reason why a skinning knife needs more surface area to, you know, hit the meat. You don't want to, you know, I've seen people skin stuff with weird stuff, but like, you know, a karambit goes this way, this knife goes this way. That's what you want to use to skin. You got more surface area, you're cutting it. It's, so obviously the purpose driven lends itself to how it's used. But, uh, some people get a little overboard with the design, the actual blade shape, because it, they want it to be recognized somehow. I'm like, man, you can't. Skinny knives, a skinny knife. You can't get a whole. You can't get a whole lot different. You you can't make it better, right? Like you can make the design a little bigger, a little smaller. Um, you want to be able to puncture. You want, you know, I like. So going from the the spine down to the tip, I like that angle because if you want to cut it upside down and up, you're not. The tip isn't so low, you're scared to puncture into the, the right. gut cavity, you know? So those little things lend itself. And when you put your finger in there and you're cutting up, you know what I mean? Like I said, yeah. if that tip is too low or too shallow, you're so worried about cutting into that, that belly cavity. So that's why I do that little drop point on that backside, raise it up a little bit. Um, because I, because I'm end user, and then you're doing works. this motion the right. whole you're time, right? Around so stuff. that makes so much more sense. Right. This belly, right? Yeah, and it's like there's a lot of skinny knives with similar shape. You can't get away from a shape that works, and it's kind of it'd be dumb to like, right. oh look at I made the Skinner like this, and like I'm it's so different than everybody else's. I'm like, yeah. oh, well, you know, you might want to go use it before you know you, you think it's that much better. So a lot of that, you know comes down then to hey you know the rest of the shape of the knife I, like I said I can make it nice and simple to bolt on grip nice texture and then I can customize it for people too so that's a lot of the fun side so if you really want your knives to be purpose driven right you can come up with your own design you got to come up with your own style and be original but there are reasons why there are certain shapes because they work right you know so how are you going to differentiate from there how are you going to really differentiate your stuff so aesthetics um using the knives you know a lot of company a lot of people make knives and sell knives and they don't use them 
sitting and on I'm a shelf. Like, right. Well, well, Shit, no, man. it's not who buys them. It's like knife makers. There's a lot of knife oh, makers. Oh, I got you. Because yeah, yeah. it's a cool thing. It's fun. It's fun to make stuff, right? So there's a lot of knife makers who make knives. And I'm like, oh, that's that's a nice skinny knife. Like, do you hunt? And they're like, mm, no, why? And I'm like, oh, that's weird. Like, on really? the next one. Like, okay. Like, I, I try to use everything. Right. You know, and I and I like the input from people who use everything. Uh, like, hey, this isn't working as good. I, you know, I prefer this. Like, okay, well, absolutely. Let me let me take on that constructive criticism and work on making things better all the time. You know. Yeah, super rad. Well, that's that little yeah, that's a nice knife. This one is uh, the the Cavner, which is always a special one to me. So this is the Cav Junior. Um, yeah. The original design. Um, Brad Cavner was a buddy of mine. Really great frog man. He died uh, a bit ago and. His little brother brought me this piece of paper, and I, I'm not sure if Aaron Von and him, you know, designed it. I know they wanted to make a knife, but uh, could have been just Brad drawing it on a piece of paper, this knife design, and his little brother brought it to me, and I was like, that's so rad. Like, what a cool thing, honor for me. Is that to do the it. actual design? So that's the actual design. Right. So I have a larger one, this junior, and I do a folder that's called the CAV, and underneath the Half by Space logo, it says HFB, and it says CAV, C-A-V on this side, some of them say Cav on this side, that's the signature he always. So I took his signature and we engraved his signature Cav on every single knife too. That's a great code, cool. man, like yeah. that's so cool. And it's a great little, you know, everyday camping, you know, backpacking. I skinned three elk with this thing last year. Um, it's such a good blade and the, at the end of the year I go through and I type in Cav into all my sales and I get that bottom line and then 10% of that we donate to different foundations, charities, outdoor stuff, veteran oriented, law enforcement oriented foundations, which is really cool. And we have that to is give back, super cool. Give back. Yeah. And that's a, that's just a special, such a good special blade, you know, for me and be able to give back and Brad himself designed it, you know? Yeah. I didn't know that, that whole backstory. That's, yeah. that's incredible. That's the Cav. Yeah. Karambit, pretty classic. Uh, you know, style fighting knife, nice slash. A little bit of terminal list in there too. Yeah, yeah. a little bit of slash. <laughs> this, yeah, this one's in terminal list. The Hunter Skinner's in there. The Spose, the Spose folder. I think the wine is in the last one. Is it? Yeah. I haven't got to the last one yet. Yeah, me neither. But that's you know a classic, uh, combative style blade held like that, and there's a way of. You so know, this is more of like a a fighting right because oh, you yeah. want to get this inside of you're catching the inside of their legs arms catching brachial arteries femoral neck you can oh, do oh, stomach so to get of yeah like arm. coming across so there's a uh, you go to youtube and look up karambit style fighting and then you know southeast asia style fighting and there there's certain moves you do to really mess people up and uh the scene uh, the scene in terminal list the book um, he cuts some dude's stomach open, then wraps his guts around the tree, and leaves yeah. him. I think, but in the movie they or the show they changed it a little bit. That's the that's the carambit. Let's call it the carambito. <laughs> so classic, you know. The first I did the crow scout, which is the larger version, and I was like, you know, it's a little on the big side, and and so I did the crow junior, which is this one. Which I own two of those, it's and such that, a good I can size. attest to it. I've skinned multiple animals with it. Yeah. I've gone through sternums. It's a uh, all animal sternums, big game, by yeah. the way. <laughs> and I mean, with a simple, just literally like putting my palm on it yep. and like going like that, yep. uh, like don't need much, you know? Yeah, we work through that. You can yeah. hammer the back of it. It's, you know, majority of the knives are S35 and S45. I have a few of the designs that are 3V, which is, that's really good steel. The 3V is really strong, not as corrosion resistant as S35 and S45. And those steels are, those are tough, good steels it's with, okay. uh, you know, good corrosion resistance, really good edge retention, a little harder to sharpen, but that edge retention goes a long ways. Um, you know, we could do, like I said, oh, sim simple to... Surfboard again, dude. Ah, uh, crow, jumping on the board. Um, yeah, if you throw it, he's just going to keep coming back. <laughs> so that's that size. And then I did I did one a little smaller called the Cowboy Carry. Okay. It's a little smaller blade. And then I just released one called the Feather Light, which I'm really stoked on. It's it's a bit smaller. I used a thinner steel, the same thickness as the Skinner. It's really light. It's like uh, 3.2 ounces or something. Is that and more for backpacking? Like back, well, I'm going to use that one this year. I'll probably take my crow and that one for my caribou and moose because those are big animals. Yeah. But that's like a solid little Skinner backpacking, camping. You could carry it on your kit, you know, if you wanted to run it in a tactical way. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty solid little that, bit. I love it. The size of the Junior is yep. amazing. I can't... 
I don't own the full uh, Crow Scout. Yeah, so this like, is, I mean, that's it's only an inch difference. The handle's the same size. So okay. if you're a, just a really big ass dude, you know, I'm like, yeah, I get the Crow Scout. But anybody just average normal size, um, I really like this size. I use I've used mine great. for everything. You know, that's a good, that's a good one. this is the full size disaster. So this is three V, pretty just. Heavy duty steel, did that drop point. Just wanted to keep that tip strong for prying, digging. Um, obviously, you don't want to pry really hard with, with just a knife. Like, go get a pry bar if you really need to do it. So, um, that's the full size disaster was the original. And, I, and I'm like, man, I got to do a junior size. So, I do a junior that's, that's is quite that a bit smaller. more of a tactical knife, you think? I think it's like it... an everyday, just kind of a workhorse. You know, I, there's a lot of guys, EOD and stuff, that'll carry it. Um, Cause it's got that strong tip and, and that was your series one lot. design correct? no series one's called the series one oh, okay. so What's then the difference so uh i mean the whole thing's different okay it's just a different style so this is one of the first series right got so it. I had the yeah. series one which i never named it's kind of a simple camp knife um and then i think i did this one second then the karambit then the crow and each one was going to have a different half face you okay. Know? So the first series, the series one was just going to be the half alliance face based on my dad's painting um, stuff. So then the, then this one original was the half of Zeus's face on him. Then the Karamba had the half of Eagle's face and then the crow had the half of the native's face. So, and then I realized, man, that's going to be a real, real bitch. All the rest of the designs I make, I'm going to have to come up with <laughs> a, new a face half face every for time. every single one. Yeah. Like I'll be, you know, Shit. 50 grand and trying to copyright faces. So, um, I was like, well, I really like this one, so I stuck with that one. That's why some of those original knives, too, are just so sought after. Like, those mm -hmm. original half face logo knives are all like super sought after. Yeah. It's nuts. Anyway, 3V this is a larger version. It's just a hefty, it's a workhorse of a blade. So we can, you know, we make it as simple and as extravagant as people want, but it's, it's very purpose driven. That's what I want, you know. That's a cool blade. My favorite, the Tomahawks. It's my uh, favorite too, man. This, uh, you know, this is a bleeding heart, just ironwood, full grip, um, with the spike, S35. The heart, you know, that heart is the, they call it the wailing heart, the bleeding heart. And there's, I was like, man, where'd that come from? Because you see, you know, I have a, uh, you see, on this no, that there is a heart on that one, but there is, if you look at, you know, look at old Tomahawks, original Tomahawks, there's all these, a lot of them have these hearts cut out. And the heart, you know, the tip of the heart. I was going to ask you about bit. that because I don't really know. So there's, you know, there's all these old stories, you know, from different ceremonial stuff. And uh, I kept looking back and I found this one story that this, uh, this son was old enough to go to war, you know, and protect his tribe. And uh, so the mother took the tomahawk, put it over his heart and made him, you know, his heart steel. And he was invincible and took his heart into the steel, you know, and. For, for going to war and feeling he was invincible and strong and made his heart steel and his and just you know I it gave him that courage in battle and that's where that's my favorite one awesome. to talk about the wailing heart the bleeding heart yeah. you know and I can imagine that also meaning like hey you know that reminds you what you go to war for of those you love the most you know and it's so sacred in that culture too I yeah. mean that was the first thing that you basically cut out of an animal right like sure. getting inside of it well you know the, the, What's cool about people give gifts all the time and uh, knives and stuff, and that's a super traditional. So all the way mm. back into from different, you know, native culture all the way to like Viking culture, giving somebody a knife was like that's the best thing. You know, if someone did something super nice for you, you gifted them your knife, and that was your knife, right? That's what you use to protect yourself. That's what you use to get food. And by giving somebody a knife or gifting a knife, even to this day and age, I view it the same way. It's like you're giving them something that they can protect their family and they can feed their family with. And that's yeah. why I like gifting knives is such a fucking cool I've thing. I've gifted several of your blades, yeah. man. Like I've gifted as many as I own probably, yeah. I, <laughs> which I, is cool but uncool too because I'm like, God, I could own twice as many, you know. But I, it's not for your everyday person right. actually we gave away one on the christmas special we weren't able to connect but uh i gave one away to jeremy shout out nice, <laughs> nice. i did take it away from him the same night too <laughs> yeah man uh, like i said those giving <laughs> gifts is, is a, that's such a meaningful thing you're right it's like not for everybody to give like i give them to people i care about i give them you know i i generally each trip i go on i take two or three with me and then but by the t crow hey buddy whoa 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 hi 
Um, I could take two or three with me each trip, and then what I do is I, uh, I, I love you. <laughs> I love you, Bobby. It's on the mic. I know. I know. Those when the hell are we getting out of here? He's like, oh, I'm hungry. <laughs> I don't know how you're going to get out of here, buddy. <laughs> you. Hey, you ready to go? I'm not. Okay. Come here. Let's move these tomahawks for you, buddy. <laughs> oh, I love my dog. He's the best. Oh, yeah. Come here. Come here. I was fucking cracking up today watching him sleep on his Lay back. Down. Like, Damn. he sleeps like a human. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> he, he climbs in bed and, like, when I climb in bed, he, he, you know, he like cruises up, lays on the pillow next to me. And that's like his, you know, the first five minutes climbing to bed, it's like end of the day, hugs, talking to him. And he knows I'll wake up and he'll just be laid out like a human next to me in bed. He's a good pup. Oh, that's uh, awesome. So back to, yeah, giving <laughs> gifts like that, they're just super meaningful. So I yeah. go on trips with two or three of them and I don't come back with any, you know, like I was in Park City or up there. And But how stoked are the people that you give it to, like, Hopefully stoked. I mean, know? you build that all the people that, and, yeah, that I've given them to are just like blown yeah. away. They're like, where did you get this? Or they already know about you and uh half face blades. Yeah. And so they're just so pumped because it's not something that you can just run down to the outdoor right. store and get it. Right? And yeah. even if you're getting online, you can't just right. get it's it. So I mean, it yeah. looks like you're pumping out some more blades lately to where, Try and, yeah. you know, we're on, we're on it. We're, you know, we get a little backed up here and there with uh, like heat treat or something like that or, you know, some of the stuff we order. But we, uh, you know, we lost a couple guys just moving away and I'm working on interviewing about 15 people this last week, this week and next week. And I try to put my five or six people on, bring them on the team. That's great. You know. How many guys do you have now? 32, I think, including myself. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, good, it's good, good team. It's all yeah. teamwork. Because this is the hundredth episode, and I contacted you about this, I decided that as a thank you to all of our listeners, we're going to give them a chance. I mean, yeah. I'd love to give every single one of right. them right for as much as they've done for me a, ch a chance at a blade. So uh, we are going to be giving away Crow Crow Junior. Crow Junior, my favorite half face blade, and I actually own. The same, uh, the same exact like blade, and I've oh, yeah. used it. I've used it in I the outdoors, and then I have a custom one made uh, with some burl wood and like red rosin that you made for me. Oh yeah. Um, but this is just an incredible outdoor knife. That's my go. -to. Anybody on the mountainside, anybody that's listening, yeah, this is yeah. this is definitely something you want to check out. And it's not. We're not doing a raffle or anything like that. I mean, obviously, we got to have a way to enter people. So, sure. you know, we'll do a follow or something and if it, uh, on Instagram. And then if you're, not, uh, if you're not on Instagram, which a lot of listeners aren't, a lot of people are, like, remote but still getting sure. podcasts That's and great. stuff. So if you email us. Yeah, um, just throw everybody on a list from people who – I usually just do a, an IG post and an email blast being like, here's how you enter. There you go. You know, yeah. And, if you're on our email list, you're already entered. Um, you know, if you want to, if you want to enter a second time, send us a screenshot of your subscription to Apple Podcast or Spotify or YouTube, whatever. Just a way to get entered. So, yeah. and then we'll let IG, you in. If you do an IG post, and I'll repost. I'll be like, "Yo, this is this is where it's at." Oh, that's awesome. Man. That's always fun. Yeah. No, but I'm super, I'm super stoked that I actually was able to swoop one up. Yeah, me too. Well, I mean, <laughs> on one of the drops, could have just hit me up and asked. I know, but I, I hate sure. asking for stuff, dude. I'm yeah, not that man. type of guy, you know. So it happens every day, and if I, I think can, if actually, I can do it, if it makes sense, if I can help out, if I can do it, if I can, you know, support, then I always, I always do, you know. Yeah. So, but it's also about supporting you. You can't give away stuff for free or anything like that. So I've always felt I know where my money's going. Sure. You know. Yeah. So that's that's why uh, I, I do it that it. way. The. uh Oh man, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, I was going to say something about, um, oh, I did. I, that's a lie. I did hit you up one time. It was when the DEF CON blades were dropping. Yeah. And I was like, yo, <laughs> yeah. can you please put one of these aside for me? And you were like, uh, oh, okay. yeah, do. it's a can't do it. So yeah, I mean, those guys, you know, I did that. I didn't have them even here in my shop. To right. Do that. So those guys handled that. We made them and, and, uh, the boys over at, the man over at DEFCON handled all that. You and know. you just did a DEFCON giveaway. 
again. Yeah, right? that, that I did it. We uh, we gave away a chef knife set, uh, and then we raffled a pair of Defcons, a tomahawk, bleeding heart tomahawk, a crow, and a, uh, a ring cardiac spike. All woodland camo, red red bolts, and uh, black. It's like a fashion statement That's between cool. the shoes right? and yeah. all that. Yeah, you carry it all on you. Wear the shoes out. For people that don't know about DEF CON or maybe they just know you through Half Face Blades, can you dive into that? Because that's been around for a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't run it. Two of my really close buddies I've known for a long time, so they run that project. And it's, uh, you know, those guys are really gifted at, at uh, making very good, cool stuff that's very hard to get, very limited. And they're not, like, they're not money hungry. They're nothing they just like that. It's like... It's a, it's a fun project to do, and they've got really good connections in the industry. There's humble, excellent people making a cool product. And they're like, hey, we, they're not trying to be like, oh, we only made this many. They're like, this makes sense, and they try to do a drop. You know, it used to be maybe a drop a year because of COVID hit. It was a couple of years before that. But then, you know, the shoes before that and some gear was the uh, LBT Mass Gray, and before that was that black multi-cam. Yeah, people the were black tripping. multi People was, tripped. There was like a huge list going around of van. People signing like, vans, force them to make more. You know, it's like, well, that's on the board. That's that's yeah. on, on Birdo. And it's funny because I've seen vans kind of trend when that started, you know, like then they started building like the MTE shoes. Yeah, they did some of their then, own camo stuff. Like, yeah. like I have know. a pair of multi, they're not DEF CON, but yeah. I have a pair of multi-cam, you yeah. know, black. I see those. Vans, they're, they're MTEs, and those and, are sick, dude. They're other, awesome not, shoes. other shoe companies will start doing those same things. Really? You know? But it's just, it, it's not the same, yeah. you know? Yeah, it's not. And what, I mean, you've experienced some of that here, you know, in what you're doing with half Face Blades. Like, I, I've i never seen a, you know, prior, and I knew about you super early just because we had some mutual friends. So they were yeah. showing me photos before, like, I think you even had a Facebook or maybe yeah, you started I, had a, I did a Facebook, Facebook and Instagram like and then that. I didn't do a, I didn't do a uh, website for like two years. So yeah. the only way to get it on the list was like via email and it was just always a wait list. And I was like, man, I had my roommate, I had my other buddy, I had my other buddy built a little shop in the backyard cause I was under the awning and it was like, here's what we could do. Let's, uh, let's take custom orders and let's make what we want. And then we'll just post what we want on the website as we get finished with it. So that started going, and then people were so upset because we just didn't have a whole lot to post. So then it was like, well, let's hire more guys. Let's train more guys. Let's build our team. And then it got to a point it was like, we can't even post stuff during the week because there's so many people complain there's just not enough. So really, we didn't plan on doing like a drop every Saturday. That really just organically came about because we start stuff at the beginning of the week. You we were going to try to stick to custom. Well, yeah. no, we wanted to, you know, we wanted to w make what we wanted and take customer orders, gotcha. right? Yeah. But as we finished stuff, okay, we're working like, oh, we finished three of them today and we put them on the website. But then they make hundreds of people go to the website. There's been only four knives. So people were so upset. Now, right. it's it's similar because it's 100 customs and production, but at least we have four to 500 knives on the website each weekend with 15 to, you know, or 1,500 to 2,000 people hitting the website. Um and really, it was just because of the timing of like beginning of the week. We're working on new stuff. We're planning everything out. We're getting some stuff seracoded. We're you know working on machines here. Um, just the timing of starting and finishing. We try to finish. Just it just is was the organic way we did it. And then we're like, hey, let's finish everything we can. You know, we're building handles one day, pinning them the next day, profiling the next day, finishing them the next day. Oh wow, Friday is our last day. Cool, photos. Get them on the website and then. We're like, originally, it was Friday evening at 5 p.m. You know, right. it was the drop. And then it was like, well, let's not, what if we got to wait, work late in the night? You know, uh, we weren't finishing everything by 3.30 or by noon. So it was like, all right, well, why don't we just do Saturday um, at noon? So that's what we stuck with now. And it's like, we get, it's, people are, you know, sometimes are upset. That's it's like, well, you should make more. I get demands to make more. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, I'm maxed out. We make, I wish. Dude, I'd make, how much goes make into more these more money things, if I could yeah, make more. Yeah. You know, and it, it, it's, I can't, like, I can't rush, you know, the custom work. I can't right. rush any of it. So it's pretty cool that it worked out that way. It's a good system. You know, we have bots that we battle here and there, but someone gets caught with a bot, they get refunded, the knives go back up. Um, it's awesome to see the buying, selling, and trading. And, as long as people are also making money on secondary market, they'll always be valuable, and that 
that value grows. So that's cool. I'm with, I'm good with that. Um, people are just buying them strictly to flip. We try to ban that and yeah, you know, block them. So, Oh, that's cool. Yeah. How do you track that? You just see them no, every week. Matt's, you know, there's uh, besides Matt, there's a few other people that work on. It's also timing. Like it takes a few, you know, it takes a couple seconds for four or five hundred knives to go live on a website. So right. when you have somebody that has three transactions in the first four seconds, when two of those seconds the knives weren't up yet, they're running something that's searching. So they use like you know keywords and stuff like that. It's limited bone turquoise cav. You know what I mean? They can type that in. It searches and it checks out. So you have multiple checkouts and. Only a few seconds that's just not humanly possible. Right. That's one of them. They have then, some troll farm set up somewhere yeah, then, where they're buying knives. <laughs> yeah, and then there's some other, you know, people People like to brag that they used bots, so that's another way that you can find people. Oh, there you go. You know, and it's crazy. We have What kind of nerds are buying these dude, knives, we have man. some people. Well, if they can turn around in three weeks and sell it for 2000 bucks, Right. And they bought it for five, six, seven hundred bucks. Yeah, especially some know. of the more custom uh, that's what they go for. and stuff, right? Or, you know, we've... People buy a production knife and then they'll take it home and they'll do some crappy ass handle on it. Is oh, they'll try do a to look, handle switch. They try to looks like it and then they'll go around on eBay and try to sell it for a thousand bucks and stuff like wow. that. So the problem How is there. How do you authenticate that? People usually just hit us up and send us a pic. Like, is this? And we can generally right. tell within a second if we did it or not. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then if we, if someone, you know, let's say someone get, does that, sells a knife for a couple grand, and that person hits us up and we, we don't think it like one they just uh, hey we're not we're not going to work on it you just voided the warranty you know it's all right like you got ripped off you should have ran it by us like we apologize like go after the guy who sold it to you right you know so that's that's it's not your responsibility and there's people i mean there's some guys who were trying to sell you know there was a dude who stole knives from my shop um and just blanks and was trying to sell them for, I think, $20,000 and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, it's just so nuts. And the person was like, well, I can make grips. I, I used to work there. I can make grips the same as they make. I was the best worker there. Told this guy who's a huge collector of ours and just loyal and was trying to sell him. He's like, oh, how much? So he was like, oh, I don't know, $20,000. Just let me know what kind of grip you want. I'll do it. It'll be the same. What? I was the best worker. Obviously, he wasn't. He got the boot. Right. He was an absolute turd. You know, and he stole knives when he left. Just blanks. It was nuts. You didn't that's think that. Kind of lame. It was like, you don't yeah. think that's going to come back to you, dude? Like, right. You're, you're mind blowing. You know, of course that's going to. Also, if you do this, think about that. Think about taking another knives, doing your own grip, selling it for 20 grand. Do you think that person's going to be okay when they hit us up and go, hey, I got this knife. Can you sharpen it? And we're like, we didn't do that grip. That's our knife. Where'd you get that? When they find out that. It's a fake. Right. You don't think that they're just going to be okay with you just have taken 20000 bucks from them or more? Yeah. You're, they're going after you. you know uh, I mean? would. Yeah. Yeah. It's not but authentic. I just buy direct from you. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's it. The way to... Like, I'm not buying it unless. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the that's rare. Facebook enthusiasts, I yeah, see them so for sale on there. I've yeah, never bought anything. But, they, but, they, yeah. they're, they're good to go. They're such a very good group of people. Uh, buy, sell, trade, raise funds for different foundations. Someone's in, you know. Hurt on there. They're raising funds for them. They're donating knives to guys who haven't got their first knives. Military, law enforcement. Um, it's been a really cool. I didn't start the group. There's a few admins on there um, that kind of run it and really try to be a positive, good group of people. It's really cool to see, you know, and I support Yeah, it's this. awesome, man. Like, that. they've been conversing for me since the first time we yeah. had them on, right? They're like, do you mind? They've hit me up. Like, Can we use some of the footage? I was like, absolutely, cool. you know, like, and I think that, I don't know. Somehow we got suckered into being on TikTok, and we'll be off of there soon. But yeah. like, yeah, that some of them have started like a TikTok for you now. Uh, that's fucking crazy or whatever. It's like, wild. that's okay. It's cool the some of the can, coolest content. They're the I'll ones running it. The Chinese will know. <laughs> they won't, it won't be me. It'll be right. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's definitely uh, something that's a bit more of a culture than it is just a business or yeah. Uh, and that wasn't you know that yeah. wasn't why it was started but um you know what it's become is really cool the support we've had is really cool the relationships and friendships there's a lot of people who you know have their custom knife made to to cut their baby's umbilical cord when it's born and you know we do ashes of people's ashes and working dogs ashes inlaid in the grips and uh people who've died they're they're you know law, law enforcement or firefighters some of their old clothing and um that's kind of the holy the holy knives that come through, the holy grail of knives being able to work on it. Yeah. And it's so cool for the guys in the back to work on and know what they're working on and who it's going to. And 
So that's a, that's a super honor. Um, that reminds me after the podcast, I got to hit you up about something. Cool. So yeah. 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 It's cool to do those knives and, and, uh, what I'd really like to do and I just need a glad, I'm glad Matt's here to take photos of everything now, but we've done a lot of just insanely special knives and it, it dawned on me. I should have done professional photos of each of each one and asked the people a little breakdown of what it is. And then we would do the breakdown of how we made the knife and do a coffee book table oh, of like yeah. this knife. This was this person's grandfather in world war two. This is part of his, his, his clothing. He died. These are his ashes in the grip. We used redwood cause he grew up in, in the redwoods in Northern California. He, you know, we put a little strip of, of this in it for that. So just is that so something cool. that you guys are working on currently or we're putting, putting some aside. We just really got to dive in to start looking back and contacting people that we've done that for, get the knives back, get some photos. We, I mean, we'd have a hundred or more just really insane, beautiful pictures. It'd just be something really fucking cool to see. I'd buy one. You know, absolutely. Yeah. So that's, that's a goal. We just, we run pretty ragged here. Everybody stays yeah, pretty man, damn it's busy. It's hard to just to keep up with the week. I maybe have to just demand, hire somebody right? like, here's your job. You know, hire someone separate. This is track down these knives. Let's get them back, get photos, get the right. little story, story of, you know, why they ordered a knife, who's, who, why it's important. And we'll do pics, open it up, picture the knife, boom, little bit, little snippet on it. That's so cool. You know, yeah. And it's something that you could add volumes to, right? Like, Absolutely. Like Tyler does or something yeah, like that. Yeah, we could right? easily yeah. do Oh, we're like, damn, we got 50. All right, we got another 50 more. Yeah. That'd be very cool to do. It'd be That'd very be awesome. special. And it's cool, too, because now you're reading about all these other important things and how it's not about, you know, the creativity is cool and the visually it's appealing, but you're like, oh, wow, this dude's ashes from World War II. And you can look that person up. It checks up all the boxes so cool. at that point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that'd, that'd be awesome. Wild. So diving back into like what I was going at or what I was getting at bef- prior to, you know, DEF CON and some of this stuff, like there are so many blade companies out there now, but they are not half face. I mean, how, it's wild. how does that make you feel, you know, kind of starting this and I mean, I mean a lot, there's a lot of similarities and <sighs> handles and it's nuts now and logos and it's nuts man. Yeah. The, the aesthetics right so right. now you know i didn't see any split material handles before we made them i'm sure there's some out there i just didn't mm-hmm. see them on social media i don't go looking you know a whole lot i follow a lot of knife companies and i love supporting and seeing that these companies do well and really cool stuff but uh, i'm sure we've been really inspirational right with uh, we as a team and our our um function and beauty and artistic and and you know original as well with everything so i think a lot of companies are like or makers are like oh man like and we get this a lot like hey you've been really huge you know you've been such a big influence and that i started making knives because of you and i'm like oh cool Let, you know let's see your instagram and i'm like oh yeah no kidding like you're trying to look exactly That's like exactly. them <laughs> yeah. and i'm like well i, I kind of like i'm like okay cool like it's kind of flattering to a point, but now when I go online, I'm, it, it's a lot. It's yeah. everywhere. And of course it's awesome. It's challenging for us to mix stuff up and, and everything. Um, and be obviously we're the original, of course it, it, it has annoyed me before, especially if someone's like, Hey, we, you were a huge influence. We loved like, you know, we'll get that. You're a massive influence. I started making knives because of you guys. I'm like, well, how about this? Why copy? Like, do, do you really make knives because of us? Because we awesome influence you? Or do you make knives because they were really awesome and you saw us successful? Right? So right. do you want to put a penny in your pocket and that's why you copy us? Because we didn't copy people when we started. You know what I mean? I'm sure there's similarities between knives, of course, out there. There's so many designs and I mean, right. And, yeah. but you can be, you can and be makers. Different. I mean, there's yeah. a major like Hatcher. He's incredible. There's so many makers out there that just do incredible well, it's work. The same and it's thing different. as comparing pistols, right? Like yeah. you can do t- different stuff with the grips. Sure. You can have different, there's different 1911 companies. Right. There's some similarities, but there's aesthetics and they're different. So, you know, one side of it is like, okay, well it's going to happen. Of course. Um, I, I, you know, my thing to those companies when I chat with them is like, you should be, you should be original because that's going to go for it. Cause anybody who they're getting a knockoff almost and people are like, wow, that really looks like a half face. 
you know, but and like, well, I, I can't afford a half face, so I'll just get a knockoff. And, and they're like, well, that's not going to hold its value. What's going to really hold its value? Like, do you, you know, do you want a, a fake Rolex or do you want a real Rolex? Like, do you want right. to go to the real thing from the real people, the real makers, and support the real brand that brought the aesthetic? Which you're hoping that someday it comes down to the, something like this, right? right? Where it's, yeah. yeah. You know, and it's not, I'm, I'm so happy we've been a big influence on, on, knife making and really it's like yeah. I, I want to be an influence on the end users using the product um i'm glad people are making stuff i want success for all those people i think the biggest lesson for them is if you're original you're going to go further you're going to sell more because people don't want the same thing you know if you're really Makes original sense, yeah. really design that lends itself to um uh, utilitarian to whatever you designed it for to work and then you can somehow be original and create from there, um, it's going to go a long ways. Instead of someone being like, well, I can't, I, man, I've tried on the drops, I can't get it, but this person has something that looks like it, I'll just get that. Right. You know, that only is going to go so far that people know it's a knockoff. Yeah. You know. Well, and I think that things are, I mean, if you pay attention, you can pick up a blade pretty much now. Like, I was able to get this for yeah. the giveaway, right? Yeah, like we're working it, on, we're trying to grow that production yeah. side. Um you know, we've we've been we've upped the production. I want to get knives. You know, I don't purposely. A lot of people have have kind of been like, "Well, you you probably hold knives back, or you have knives in stock, and to make it limited." And I'm like, you know, "We make, we put everything we can finish up out." You know what I mean? So if we're able to get that week, we get more knives back from Heat Treat, or I have guys Serico, and I'm able to. It's crazy make sure that handles. people are that critical of you. <laughs> it's, it's wild. It's, I mean, I'm like, so I get more knives out. So then right. knives will last a little on, longer on the website. Awesome. You know, obviously people are after the customs, they retain their value for a long time and they can buy, sell and trade. But, but also originally I only did customs right. originally. And I was like, man, I want to get more to the people. I want to get more people, knives, you know, and tools in their hand that work in their walk in life. And I was like, we need to do production. So I was like, all right, let's pick this knife and this knife, the most sold and used knives. Let's do a production version. So that version's like, okay, cool. So we have that knife that's 350 bucks where it starts at, you know, 550 or 600 the custom side so I, I i didn't mind it didn't devalue which is really cool but i wasn't scared of devaluing in people's minds the knives or the company by getting more out there i didn't do that we've always had that demand and i want we're not going to ever be devalued we're going to crush it but i didn't i didn't want to be like well i'm going to keep it so limited so that drives the value of everything through the roof, right? I want people to get those knives. I want people to have a good tool. And it's really cool that it's the value has grown even with the growth of the business because the demand has grown. And we try to keep up, like, there's more demand than, than we have product. But never one time have we held product back. You know what blows me away? Like, I've known about you from pretty much the beginning, right? Like, right after the Series 1, I think I put my first order in through the... Facebook or whatever yeah. through messenger or whatever. And the very first one I got was a gift and I've showed, I don't know. I mean, it's one of my favorite things, right? It's one of my, all my half face blades are some of my favorite yeah. possessions, cool, right? Yeah. Uh, aside from my kids, you know what I mean? Like yeah. they're number two <laughs> <laughs> cause I can replace other stuff. Right. But like something like this feels irreplaceable. You know, that's why it's a uh, gift. You know, that's yeah. why when you give it as a gift, it's meaningful. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, the best give gift that I can think to give yeah. to somebody, right? Same. And if you can go custom, it's even better. But I've shown your stuff because I've been such a fan of it from the very beginning to I don't know, maybe a thousand people. That's cool. And I don't think I've ever had one person be like. Oh, that sucks. Or that's not cool. Uh, that's or not, like, that's not interesting. No, they're interested. <laughs> Typically they're hitting like 95% of them are hitting yeah. me up later. Like, yo, what was the name of that I blade company? How or how do I get one? Yeah. Can you contact Andy for me? Can you, and, and yeah. especially now that we have listeners and you've been on here, True. we get so many messages that are just, wow. I'm like, I don't know, dude, you got to go to the cool, website. Man. So we so, yeah, on it. we're so, always working on it. Like we, we, we kind of started doing a new thing. We just recently, maybe a month ago, um, w you know, let's say we have 250, 300 production knives we were able to finish a week, sometimes more, sometimes a little less. So what we started doing, which I'm hiring more guys, part of this whole thing, a little tangent, is I, I like to provide jobs. Like, I don't need to be 
just me sitting in a shop pounding steel out, growing my name Andrea Arbido. Like that's not the point I want. Like then I like I do one insane three or four thousand dollar knife a week. You know what I mean? Right. Like, every two weeks. Like that's fucking awesome. There's incredible makers out there that do that. That's just not what I wanted to do. I wanted to get tools into people's hands. I wanted to hire my friends. I want to surround myself with my buddies. Uh, that's mentally healthy for me. I want to provide jobs. You know what I mean? So being able to grow the business is extremely important to me. Being able to get these tools in people's hands is extremely important to me. You know, supporting things I love to do, hunting, supporting my time. Now I have grown the business where I get to go see my family more. I get to go hunt more. I get to use these tools is extremely important to me. So, you know, being able to produce more production knives, a little bit, uh, you know, obviously cost less than custom. I'm going to do that. What we kind of start doing, I'm going to hire guys, some a couple of guys that work work just on taking the materials that we genuinely use for custom handles. We're going to start doing machined bolt-on grips. So we just started doing that, like nice. I was showing you, like this one, right? So production production style blade. We could still do rock work, um, but we did you know a, a light desert ironwood grip, but oh, that's sweet. all machined so and bolted switch on. Out but your you own could, grips? you could. Yeah. So. What's cool is we didn't do it specifically so guys can switch out, but they absolutely can. Yeah. We did it because I wanted to get a lot of that custom, the custom stuff because it's it's more valuable. It's more people like that even more in the production. But I wanted to get more of them done. So now we have that full custom, a custom production, which is using all these natural materials. But the, all that grip is machined and they're bolt on. That and is then wicked, the full man. production, which is like G10, like cars. There's some obviously really nice carbon fibers out there we do. But what's cool is I'm gonna I'm gonna hire more guys. I'm gonna hire five or six more guys in the next month. Yeah, that's another job, and right? Some guys start custom side learning everything. I'm gonna have two more guys go to the production side. I'm a one guy that's all he's doing is prepping and and taking custom custom style uh, aesthetic grips and wood and stuff like that and doing machined bolt on. So we'll take those 300 knives a week production. And then maybe 50, 60, 70 can be really rad bolt on. And then you can be like, oh, cool. Well, I have a Black Crow Jr. at home. That would look cool in my Black Crow Jr. So you can take the grips off this and put on your Black Crow right? Jr. Like yeah. you win a knife at a giveaway yeah. and you don't like the handle? Well, yeah. guess what? Now, I'm not yeah. selling grips off the site because as right. of now, they go, they go on all the knives. At some point, if I can do that, that'd be rad. Like, oh, hey, I'm dropping 10 different you know Burlwood grips on the site. I'll just do another little line item up there and put grips sure. up and people can buy them. Now, these don't won't work on all the Crow Juniors back in the day that we did by hand. They'll only work on the ones where we started machining them. You know, mm -hmm. and these machine, they're all machined around the outside. So you'll have to kind of figure I out where it works. I actually bought the same exact knife to keep my, my original Crow Junior yeah. in the safe because it's like I was so worried about losing it in the back yeah. country and it has a Kydex sheath and it was starting yeah. to wear out. So like... I we'll may need it. to send that to you to get yeah, a new sheath made or something. Easy. Yeah, that's easy to do. But uh, but I bought this just yeah. so I was like, okay, if I lose it, I'm gonna be super fucking pissed. But yeah, that's not a, as pissed as I would right, be with that custom that first. Yeah, yeah. So that's cool. I'm I'm really looking forward to bringing guys on, and we kind of with the recession coming and not knowing how it's gonna affect the business, and we're up in our product, like up in production knives to get to people's hands. I was like, you know, it's kind of was like, man, let's I can provide more jobs and take that production and do some custom production ones, which would be equally as valuable and secondary market and fun for people to use and switch handles out. And I like these natural products. I like that Western native wood bone yeah. antler. You that know looks I mean? sweet. So, I didn't even notice that when you pulled it out earlier because yeah. the desert camo is so desert. distracting, right? But I didn't yeah. notice the handle. All wood. So, so I'm stoked on this. Sweet. We just started doing that. That'll be fun to get out to people. Yeah, I know. That's, that's amazing. And then what's dope is we have the Spose folder. So that, that, you know, the Spose originated, uh, originated from a buddy who was out. Augmenting. You have one right there. Yeah, right? he was yeah. augmenting one of the SEAL teams. Well, the original fixed blade one. And he, you know, drew it up. He hit me up. He's like, hey, what about this? We kind of tweaked it. And we started making them here. And uh, eventually that became a, a folder. And then eventually, it, you know, one of the guys here, Sean, who was helping me set up my machines, he, he's still active. He, he and a couple of his buddies out in Ohio started a machine shop just to help with our folders and do nice. monolithic single titanium frame, which is really cool, what? really different. That's yeah. what this one is. Okay. Yeah, it's, got, it's a single titanium frame versus, you know, folders generally have two sides bolted together with a yeah. spacer. So that's just, it's a little push button. 
And is the, are those available on the site now? Yeah, so I, I did. I've been continuing to do those. Luckily, they're, they've gotten it down. They're, they're fairly quick at it, and I'm able to keep them stacked on the site. That is a single piece. That's awesome. That cool. So now this fall, which is awesome, that's such a very... I really like this lock, too. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a press fit, so the whole thing turns the whole pivot. So there's wow. not a lot of friction. So some people are like, well, it, you know, when I fling it open, it opens too fast or it closes too fast. I'm like, well, what? just <laughs> slow down, like <laughs> just lightly flick it. Don't, right. don't flick it hard. Don't close it super hard. You're not tactically closing it. There's not somebody coming up with a gun and threatening you like, oh, fuck, I got to close it and stick it in my shit. And like, I'm like, dude, chill out. You don't need to put the gun away as fast as you pulled it out. Right. You know, you're, you're okay. <laughs> I'm sure Read you the have, situation. have you seen those videos of the guys going into knife shops and doing like, oh, career, so like right. stuff? It looks I like they're going to cut their hand the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> but so that's rad. So this fall, what's cool is this is such a very specific to, you know, like tactical use combative, small tip. It's for skin, clothing, getting through that stuff. Mm -hmm. So what's really, I'm really stoked on is this fall we'll be putting out the crow and disaster folder in a monolithic frame. Nice. It's really stoked. We're, you know, we're working on doing a deep carry pocket clip that'll clip into here, mm. and you can switch it either side for left or right, right-handed guys. The um, one of the, you know, like from when we first put them out, we get that const constructive criticism, like, hey, you know, I kind of hit the button. You know, it's a little easy to hit the button, so we built up the next ones. We'll have this little, little channel of titanium right above the push button, so you really have to get over the channel to push down, and just Got those it. little things. I want to make everything better and. You know, I can be like, wow, this is amazing. And then I can get, I like that feedback. Like, hey, check this out. What about this? One of the hard things is people are like, well, it, it, it's really great with jeans. But when I wear my running, running shorts, right. you know, I'm like, well, try putting it up in the top of your running short, shorts, you know, this little space. And it's like, that's a hard thing. That's like, normally how I carry my Yeah, you know, those like, clips are a little yeah. hard to get, like every pair of pants that's going to fit good so that's where that deep carry pocket clip, clip will come in and it's just you know i'm always open to making things better if we can yeah yeah that's that's awesome i don't think i've ever seen a one piece folder there's very few out there yeah you know they're a little they're a little pricier because of the level of of uh machining that i needs can to imagine be done and yeah how, how you make it and i i mean i they're stronger that single frame um, definitely really cool. Like I can't, I can do a lot of cool stuff by hand, but man, yeah, I look at the computer and it shuts down. <laughs> like, oh, what are you doing? I just looked at you. Yeah. Right. Or yeah, it's because my programs. dog runs behind me and unplugs my computer four or five times. Puts a, a new day. ding in your surfboard or probably yeah. damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you've mentioned to me several times about getting out of California. Is that, Still a High goal. On the priority list, or yeah, what's, I mean, not at the moment. It's got to be hard for you to leave here, right? Because you're so embedded with guys, yeah, and sometimes I'm like, man, I'd love just. I, I got to get a ranch one day, no matter what. That's yeah. been a goal of mine. And I'm like, oh man, I can't wait to get a ranch, just be on my ranch. And then I'm like, and I dive into what I'm gonna do on my ranch. And three days later, in my head on my ranch, I'm like, man, where are my fucking friends? Right. And now I'm gonna have to like, hey, uh, you wanna you wanna come out, like, hang out for a yeah, week? Can you come like, hang out with next the guy, next yeah. guy? And then I'll be like, man, I. Should have bought a bigger place and made all my friends move here too. So I, I'll definitely get a ranch. You know, my my that's a little more long term. Um, I keep that goal. That's my biggest goal. But my short term, you know, I probably would have moved in the next year or so. But this recession, everything's coming. We've been looking for a bigger location here in San Diego to purchase this whole last year. Looked at a few; they were either too big or the market's really nuts where the housing market's absolutely crazy and the you know commercial real estate they were like well the housing market's crazy we'll just charge more too so you know we've looked at places that would have worked and that if, you know rent being let's say two dollars and fifty cents a square foot they want to charge sales wise like four dollars a square foot so you're already a million and a half in the hole Jesus. and it's only because inventory is low or biotech is buying it all up and i'm like well, that, you know, and that's going to take me, now I have to live in that place for two to three years to, to even break even. Yeah. And I'm like, that's pretty uncool. Like, I get, I get a couple hundred thousand over, but, you know, there was a place that was like 1.9. I, I don't know. I, there was a place, no, it wasn't one point nine. There was a place recently that I offered like three or 400,000 over what they were asking. What? And they were like, oh, they asked for another 100,000 over that. And I was like, you know, I'm not going to come look at it. Screw you. I'm like... Like you yeah, could have just right. said, all right, so cool. So you're over the asking price, and yeah. then they said they countered with 
We yeah. want more yeah, money. I, 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 well, why the fuck did you I even offered, list it? I offered for that. I offered three hundred, two hundred thousand over, and they came back with three hundred fifty thousand wow. over. They wanted, and I was like, you know what? <laughs> like, I'm not even come look at it. It'd be cost fifty grand to build out anyway. Right. But I really do need a bigger location. I'm putting four or five, six guys more on payroll. We're slammed into the shop. Everybody crushes it. But being able to have a bigger break room, more comfortable for the guys, a bigger chill spot for lunch, um, would be obviously ideal. Right. Add a few more machines. Like I said, it's maybe it's a blessing we haven't got one because we don't know what this recession holds for everybody. Um, I want to provide more Has it slowed you job. down at all? Or? I don't know. I mean, like I said, we're flexing to do some of these really cool custom production grips. Um, I don't know. You know, we've grown. We've grown this year. We've been Every able to time I go on the jobs. site, the blades are sold out. Yeah, so. you know, yeah. that's that's good. It's, it's, you know, we're, like I said, we're doing stuff. We have that calf folder. Uh, our design is being worked on in Tennessee by an old timer. Sean's shop in Ohio. We don't have the space to work on folders. You know what I mean? So they're working on the Spose folder, the, you know, the uh, Crow and Disaster folders there, which we'll have before the end of the year. The guy in Tennessee, uh, we've been working back and forth on him. On CAD, uh, possibly doing a karambit, take our karambit and do a oh, little karambit nice. folder um, as well. So that's stuff that I can be outsourcing because I don't have the the manpower or space here, but I still want to do it, and it's still my design working with those guys or the engineer-minded guys who do CAD, and I can sit there and be like, okay, this, this, and it's all based on my original designs that are fixed blades, which is really cool. Letting and them it's employing creative. more people too, man. Like 100%. That's... Well, those guys, so Sean, those guys who started working on that monolithic frame, Spos, they start a brand new machine shop. And it's like, you know, they you, you get a million bucks worth of, of badass equipment. Like, you have to have some sales right out the gate. And then you got to yeah. collect. Like, do you want to pay yourself and pay off machines out the gate, you know, and you're, you're taking those loans, you know, so you know, being able to, it's a, a big trust thing. And, and I, I trust those guys. I trust Sean. So luckily he worked here and built that relationship. So out the gate, we're like, okay, you know, I'm going to agree to order a thousand, a thousand folders and here's 50% up front. Right. That, you know, gives them some, the only leverage they have outside of maybe pulling money out of your pocket is being able to put money down for equipment. So they just have built their, you know, in one year they'll have, they'll have made enough that they're, three guys on salary they can hire some stuff out they're ordering more equipment they're ordering you know what i mean so what a cool thing is you know he helped me set up my shop and in turn he sets up the shop and i'm three three thousand spos and i'll have another thousand of the crow ordering from him and that money's coming in here we're selling them that's flowing back to those guys those veterans and their business um that old time in tennessee helping his business grow so you know with the support from people supporting us that money comes in and it's all go it's going out and we're going to be able to support it. And that doesn't, that's not even talking about the foundations and everything. So right. it's, it's like a, I like being a conduit for providing more jobs and, uh, and that's not just in-house that's supporting other oh. business. Man, we have a bunch of guys, you know, we have another guy, AJ is helping us out. He's working on, um, horizontal milling for us. Um, and the Kydex and stuff like Kydex that. Is outsourced, outsourced to some veteran, right? veteran yeah. guys, 40 minutes from here, 35 minutes North of here. And they've been growing. They got, you know, it was in their garage and then it, they just got a shop and now they just hired two more guys. I'm like, if we're growing, you're growing. Yeah. You know, I want, I want to pay you. I want to see, I want to pay you 300 grand this year for Kydex, not 150. That means I'm growing and I'm able to support you. And that's really cool and really important. And uh, I like, you know, people who are listening to this to know, you know, it's like, this, we're like that conduit to help and support other veteran owned businesses and other businesses in general across America. Yeah, no, that's super awesome. And it, it's cool that you've kept it that way too, because it's, it's very humble, man. Like, that's all I got to say. It's yeah, a good team. It's, that's cool. Yeah. If you, uh, if you decide you want to come to Colorado and check out some spots, man, I'd be glad to show you around. I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. come to Colorado. I'm going to go check out Colorado Springs. Okay, That's one spot. You know, I, I really like Steamboat Springs and small towns like that, but, uh, I have a lot of guys that would just, it's too small for them. Right. Um, and too far from an airport. So being able to, I have a lot of guys that want to move. So I think I'll check out Colorado Springs. I got a buddy pretty close by there. You know what? You're an hour and a half from the airport. You got the mountains right there nearby. Um, there's really so many good, cool towns just outside yeah. of Colorado Springs too, that cool. are super dope, you know, that are kind of ranch community type cool. stuff. And 
so you can be 30 there. minutes you can be in the springs or something sure. like that sure and you yeah. got woodland park up on the hill and yeah cool area so some good hunting there i know there's good fishing there's uh, there's a lot of people guys. man <laughs> it's not bigger. like here though yeah there's a lot of people here but like i said i can't be in too small of a town either. right so we're, we're eyeballing that place a few other places it's just a matter of is it important for you out. to be around a military town? Like no, I don't no. Know I mean. Okay, I was wondering if that was part of Colorado Springs or no. There's just not like I looked at Durango, but where's the airport? Like right, a guy's gonna have a hard time flying in and out. Like Pagosa Springs is awesome, yeah. tiny. I would definitely be on the Western Slope if I didn't have to travel. Like yeah. it's it's so convenient, and especially with like the kids, and not to mention like when you have kids and a lot of my family's there, but like the infrastructure that's built, you know, you get yeah. in some of those rural areas and something happens. You're, yeah. you know, a school, helicopter school options and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. And then just being oh. able, <laughs> hey, <buddy. laughs> being able to get to an airport is super important too. Yeah. As much as yeah. And I travel a lot and I want like the that. guys, you know, I want guys to be able to, I'll have a shop here. I'm not going to take, pull the rug out from the guys here. Yeah. So if we need to downsize the shop a little bit, that's fine. But we'll have a shop here for guys who can't don't uh, who can't move, and then um, guys can come up there. And then guys here, they're like, "Hey, well, I can move now." They might come there, and we'll see. You know, there's this life throws wrenches into stuff, and and things change. So I'm not like it's not like we have a date to move, and we want to continue to grow here and do what we can and providing more jobs here before that but that's like a that's a i keep you know i say like a two-year plan a year ago and then now it's another two-year plan right. because of recession and maybe i just need to pull the trigger but i just have a lot going on and i'm really you know focusing on growing the business and teaching guys in the shop and you know i don't i also don't want to workaholic so much that i don't well enjoy you got life, so much so. going on outside yeah. of this too like yeah. kbd and defcon and <clears throat> Uh, Canoe Warpaw. Club now, yeah. Warpaw. Let's talk yeah. about Warpaw a little bit. A little man. side like, project, yeah. from kind of an ode. I grew up in wine country in Napa Valley, and just you know, I like I like wine, and I have some buddies in the wine industry, and I I've wanted to do it for a while. I like the process. I've made wine, I've made beer, I've made spirits, and um, it's beautiful up there. And I ran into a buddy who's an army prior army guy, and he's a winemaker and works for a winery Another up guy. there. And, yeah, and uh, he has his own label, uh, Lucier uh, Wines, and I had been working kind of on a little business plan on the side and wanted to do it and had a name already to go, and um, this worked out, ran into him, and I was like, hey. You make my yeah, and maker? some of the some of the artwork kind of translates over, and yeah. like you've kept that native, you know, influence yeah. to it too, which is yeah. super cool. Yeah, that, it's, you know, the handprint, that red handprint, um, there's a lot of handprints being used these days within um, different brands, native brands, stuff like yeah. that, which is really interesting. Um, some of the stuff like, uh, you know, I remember the one that's up the black hand over the mouth is like, you know, we're being silenced. We're not being heard. There's another one, uh, War Party Movement. It's a guy who retired who raises funds for uh, indigenous missing women's and uh, women and stuff like that, kidnapping. and. We've actually raises... had him on the podcast. Oh, nice. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah so dude. he does that. And then... The original red handprint, actually, if my people want to do their history buff stuff and go look, and uh, was was meant for war ponies. They were only meant for war ponies that right. brought their riders back alive. So you went to battle, success against your enemies, success in hand-to-hand -hand combat. You had a red red handprint on your war pony, and you rode it back home. You know what I mean? So if you die in battle, you're even if well, that would mean you're not successful. You could have been successful, which they would have you know counts of your bravery and stuff, but. It was meant for the war ponies that brought their riders back. Yeah, alive. the horses got war paint. That's what it was. It, you didn't have it on your body. You would have that red paint on, on the horse, <laughs> you know, which is really cool. Jocko goes, get me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, that's yeah. that's the red handprint. And then I have I have four little logos on the back, and they each stand for something. Um, <laughs> Between me and Crow are dying over right? here. But he <laughs> dropped some, some uh, Jocko go in his, in his eye socket. Yeah. Um, the four little logos in the back each have a lot of meaning and I worked on those for a while and it's, it's, uh, it's a cool little 
we were working on making some really good juice. How hard is that process? I mean, to me, that's like, I wouldn't even know where to begin, how long. I mean, it takes a couple of years, right? It depends what it is. From grapes growing to yeah, I mean, actually having it bottled. depends if it's a air. white, a red, stuff like that, how long you want to age it. Generally, that, you know, a cab is going to be five or six years. Wow. So my cab is, is be really incredible. It'll be when is that five years. Be available? Five years. Yeah. So a long-term investment on that one. Um, the Chenin Blanc I just released, that's from last year. So it'll get a little better with as it sits in the bottle. Um, the red blend is uh, from my buddy who did his wine um, 2016 and then 19 because there was fires in between. And it's a really incredible red blend. So he had extra and he was able to sell me and I was able to do all the um, labeling and everything, which is um, really awesome that he even had some and it's really good so it's able to do out the red blend what's, what's really cool is that Chenin Blanc the Pinot that'll be coming up at the beginning of next year is all from wineries that we walked my winemaker walked um, that we got contracts with that he he made from scratch and we bottled and and uh, that'll be it's kind of that much more special you know see if Jocko gets me too right. it was like the last bit of it like extra carbonation or something man uh, In, inhaled it trying to get the last little bit out of it those are good though i yeah. like the orange yeah the orange is good they just uh reformulated it too so it's it used to have a little bit of an aftertaste and it yeah, doesn't better uh, yeah it's killer with vodka but we're not doing that this time not this time <laughs> you know getting into a little bit of the wines and stuff like that what's the coolest process of that i mean there's so much like are you involved in the whole uh, bottling and aging and, so yeah. i mean i i wish i was more involved but it, uh, the picking it's well it's in the fall and that's where hunting season starts too so like trying to juggle that in between like running up there on the weekend um you know what's cool is they're testing the sugar like gw he tests the the berries daily to figure out when to pick so there's the perfect amount of sugar in it because you want the perfect amount of sugar and when you add that you know, the, when it ferments, you want to get that amount, that certain hit of uh, level of alcohol, 14, 14 and a half, right? So you have to hit a certain bricks and stuff of sugar. You don't want to prematurely pick when there could be more sugar in it. You don't want to pick late because it bursts and now that juice is dumping into the ground, right? It ferments, right? Right. So he'll mark, he'll test it and mark rows. Some people mark plants. And then in the evening, it's cold. The sugar's hardened. So they come out there and they cut it, cut all those, stack it in a bin. You don't want to stack it too much because you'll be breaking the berries underneath. Go in, separate the greenery from the berry, fill up the barrel, and let it start fermenting on its own. As it ferments in the barrel, boom, it separates the skins from the juice. Then you go in, you pump that juice out. Skins out, you have it in a bin, skins on top, juice underneath, and you punch in it and you push it down, push it down. And the skins are what makes it red. So you want longer the skins, you get that deep rich. You want to do like rosé, you're just doing the skins a little bit. It's just a little bit pink. You know what I mean? So You're um, not putting out a rosé, are you? No. Okay, good. No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> not, not yet. Yeah. But I wouldn't. It's a, that's a separate project. Right. Um, anyway, it's, it's such a cool process. And GW, you know, he's, he's very knowledgeable. His wine's really incredible. You know, his, his, his ideal way of, of uh, the process it's the same as mine. It's like the less human interaction, the better. C keep everything clean. Right. Um, do what we're supposed to do to, to you know, guide it. And, and less interaction, the better. You know, which is really cool. Yeah, I didn't know that whole process so intense until, actually, until you started the wine label. Because yeah. I've been kind of following it, right? And well, some people don't like that. do that. Some people yeah. are like, oh, well, it's, it's this date. Let's just pick everything. What's he growling at? He's growling at you? He's growling at Matt? No. <laughs> Just woke up and started growling at you. You spend three days a week with him. I mean, he thought he saw some ghosts in the other room. All right. Well, we better wrap it up. Crow's ready, I think, <laughs> dude. We've done two hours. This has been oh, awesome, man. man. So uh, I really appreciate you having me back out. Oh, I'm stoked course. and pumped that you're the 100th episode. So I'm stoked, yeah. man. I really appreciate it. It's First episode of awesome was awesome, and um, I yeah, go back it. and listen to that, man. We talked a lot yeah. of cool shit, and we talked about new stuff on here yeah. too. And uh, yeah, before we jump off, let's drop everything, man. You know, from half face, where to find that? Yeah, war um, paw, anything sure. you got coming up? Sure. Uh, well, half face blades, like uh, 
as as it says, you just look that up. There's the website, the social media, Warpaw, Warpaw.com. That's the wines. There's two of them up right now. Working on more. Um, you know, KBD, WeKBD.com. Just working on little projects. Do a drop, and then we'll work on new projects. Do a little drop, kind of fun. DefCon. Um, that's once a year, maybe. Just cool drop, and those guys run that. Uh, Canoe Club, which is awesome. My best friend Ryan Bates. Uh, uh, we want to do an ammo, ammo company. One more question, yeah. Uh, before we hop off here. Yeah. You know, on the very first episode that I did with you, which I think was 42, you were talking about going up to Alaska and retrieving your dad's yeah. prop from the plane, from yeah. the plane crash. Where are you at on that? I saw you and Bates up there. Yeah, so we went did up and ran it? a really cool thing called Arctic Guardian, helped out with this fun get out of here bro this fun shooting course uh up there for the law enforcement military and everything and then uh we took a day to fly up and try to find the crash site which is we found it in like 10 minutes we couldn't see this the crash site itself but some of the natives up there put this little metal airplane on top of the mountain up there and welded my dad brother's names in it so we saw that pretty quick i didn't have an exact location so i kind of map studied and was like i think it's here and it's you know 500 maybe a thousand yards away from where i thought it might be we just saw it on the mountain there. So there's some other guys flying it up there as the snow melts to see if they see the wreckage. Um, man, I really wanted to get up there this year. I want to make it kind of something cool that I, special for my, take my mom, maybe my dad's best friend, either fly some planes in there. I have a buddy who's kind of looking to see if we can fly in within a mile of it where we can land a plane, then hike up to it. If we can't do that, we'll take helicopters in, land, hike up to it, maybe film it and uh, get that prop off the mountain, which would be really cool. That's right. Yeah, so this is... Just this, it's been so busy and I haven't been able to really sit down and discuss the logistics too much with somebody. I know that there's some different companies that like to be involved in that, which would be really cool to involve a few people, um, you know, cost a bit. So maybe raise some funds yeah. to do that. And I, you know, it's cool as I posted that and it's really special for me getting up there and doing that. And it, it means a lot for a lot of my friends. They know what's happened and they know, you know, I've wanted to find that crash site and, and, uh, I mean, I, I can imagine the amount of comments are like, hey, I want to go. Hey, I want to go. Hey, I want to hike up there. Like, I'd love to go hike that with you. You know what I mean? It's really cool. I got so many texts and emails like, yeah, I'd love to be part of that, which is really cool. So, you know, I can't imagine making it a group thing and flying 50 helicopters. We need some 40, <laughs> need some 47s full of people to go yeah. hike up on the mountain. But that's a pretty cool uh, adventure and closure and, you know, something I want to take my mom on. And we'll get there. We we'll yeah. get in here, you know, put names on it, and we'll stick it above the door, whatever new shop we have. So if I That's can't right, do it this dude. year, I'll do it next year. Yeah, man. Get up there, get that thing, man. Yeah. That's awesome. That'd be cool. All right, so sorry. Back to Canoe Club. I just you Canoe brought Club. up Bates, and it yeah. reminded yeah, me yeah. of that, dude. I've been trying to set something up with him, no, but we just haven't been dude, able man. to connect. He's busy too. He's you know? uh, he he's gonna be working on a TV show coming up here, a Netflix show. It's gonna be really cool. Yeah, he got connected with that. Um, That'll be a really cool show. But Canoe Club, I have ammo company with him out of Vegas. It's been weird. Ammo's been a little slow this year, but surprising. It'll it'll take off even more. But, you know, he wanted to spend, he's got a new little girl, and he wants to spend more time with his family. And he was like, let's do something where I can stay home and, and be with my wife and kids more. And I was like, yeah, let's do it, you know. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And light helmets. So I have, well, Protect with those guys from protect, you know, I uh, was able to get in on that a little bit with those guys. And, and, uh, I, those are just such good people and good brand. And I have, you know, in my affiliates on half face blades, I try to put some companies that there's really, a bunch of companies really trust there. and, uh, and, and like, and like to support, um, protect and light helmets. So it's a helmet company that's the football helmets and they're, you know, the highest rated from Virginia tech and they're two pounds lighter than all the other helmets. Oh no shit. They're growing. They're here in San Diego. And the, the guy who started is my business mentor and, and a really good guy. And they're, it, they're badass, man. They're ba I mean, they're they Kevlar reinforced lighter. Like I said, and do they Redell. make tactical helmets too? Or is it no, just football? Yeah. Then they'll, I think they're going to work on a soft one for soccer and, and like lacrosse and stuff like that eventually. But nice. they're, you know, Drew Brees is a spokesperson for us and, it's a good, it's a good, good company, man. It's growing. That's awesome, man. Yeah. My son just decided he wanted to play football this year. Something I was like never gonna push on him, you yeah. know. And he came to me. He's like, "Dad, I want to play." I was like, "All right, let's mm -hmm. go. Get you the best so, gear." All right, yeah. I'll have to check out That's the light cool. helmets then for yeah. sure. Andy, thanks, buddy, man. Good. This has been Pleasure. awesome, man. I always enjoy seeing you, and thanks for everything that you do, bud. Yeah. So, no, I right. appreciate being here. Take it easy, everybody. 
Thank you for listening. Thanks for sticking with me. 100 episodes, man. Yeah. Fucking rad. Come uh There'll be more. Figure out, follow us on IG or whatever. We'll put some information on the website too uh, how you can win this knife. So, so yeah. Thank you guys. See ya. This episode of the podcast is exclusively brought to you by the newly reformulated Jocko Go Energy Drinks. This is my go-to before any podcast, workout. You can say I'm truly addicted to these things. One of the reasons why is I love the flavor profiles, and that is something that the Jocko Fuel team has done to improve Jocko Go Energy Drinks. They have completely reformulated the flavor system while staying true to the ethos of making the cleanest, healthiest energy drink possible. This is truly my go-to above all other energy drinks. I honestly don't even drink any other because of all the BS that's in them. Jocko Go energy drinks are naturally caffeinated, sugar-free, keto, and paleo-friendly. There are no artificial colors, sweeteners, or flavors. It is packed full of B12, B6 vitamins, electrolytes, natural caffeines, amino acids, and nootropics. So if you need some alpha GPC in your life to help you crush it like I do, then go check out Jocko Go. There is a multitude of different flavors, but some of my favorites right off the bat are the Afterburner Orange, Whoop-Ass Watermelon, Citrus Psycho are my go-tos. Oh yeah, and I can't leave out the Sour Apple Sniper. Each one of these energy drinks only has 10 calories and gets you focused and in the right mindset to tackle whatever you need to do on a daily basis. One of the best things about this product that I really like, if you look at all other energy drinks, there is a ton of preservatives in them. There are no preservatives. This is a pasteurized product. And this is just one of the amazing products available at Jocko Fuel. If you're looking for a force multiplier and no matter what you're trying to crush, simply visit JockoFuel.com and you can find everything that you need there. Now, here's the best part. Because you're listening to this podcast right now and Jocko Fuel is such an amazing sponsor, they are offering you as the listener 10% off your entire order every time that you visit Jocko Fuel. If you enter TMS10 at checkout, you're going to get 10% off your entire order every time that you visit JockoFuel.com. If you're too lazy to type in JockoFuel.com, there is a link in the show notes wherever you're listening to this podcast right now. Simply click that. It's going to take you right to JockoFuel.com. And don't forget to use promo code TMS to save 10% off your entire order every time that you visit. Thanks for listening to the Mountainside Podcast. If you haven't had a chance to do this already, please take a moment, follow, like, subscribe, or rate on whatever platform you catch the Mountainside Podcast at. Also, if you'd like some more information on upcoming episodes, safety tips, access to all of our affiliates, and all the badass discounts that we get here at the Mountainside Podcast, check out themountainsidepodcast.com.